I've deleted the term depression from my vocabulary. I'm overwhelmed. What do you mean you're overwhelmed? You're weak. Damn. But there are situations where you're hanging on by a thread. It brings you to the realization that in one moment, everything can be gone. And I remember you and I get an email on Easter at 8 a.m. We were going to be in the dean's office. Yeah. We come in, we sit down, and he's like, do you understand the, what you guys just did? For me, it's like, how do I push past mental barriers that's like, I want to give up when there's three minutes left, but it's like, I'm here to compete. So the answer to that question is that's absolutely false. It's unequivocally, overwhelmingly false. Wow. Dr. Jacob Wilson, the Muscle PhD. Welcome back, brother. All right, man. Great to be here. Oh, it's been too long. We, 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 too long. We've been waiting to have this conversation probably for, I don't know, three, four years. Yeah. It's, been, it's been forever. But I think there's a lot that we have to catch up on, and I think people are going to be excited to hear Let's this. Let's do it. So before we jump into some of the new things, let's talk about um, from a business perspective. We've learned a lot over the course of our careers, um, but before we were we created ASPI, and we'll get into that, we were in academia, right? Um, could you give me your perspective on some of the pitfalls, so to speak, of just academics as a whole? Yeah, absolutely. You know, look, I was raised where education was super important, super important. But I think like from the era that our parents came from, I think education was different than it, what, it, what it is presently. In fact, if you look at throughout all of history and you look at the greatest psychologists of all time, when they talk about education, the best way to learn is by doing, right? So if I'm going to become a great salesperson, um, what I need to do, sell. If I'm going to become a great firefighter, I need to go firefight. If I'm going to be a great baseball player, I've got to play baseball. So learning, and this is just a fact, is specific to the task, mm -hmm. right? And I think, um, and you need to be faced with several problems that are out of left field. Constantly, the world is constantly changing. We're constantly adapting. If the pandemic has taught us one thing, it's that things can change. Look at businesses during the pandemic. You saw businesses that were nothing become something during the pandemic and others go out of business. And once everything went back to, to pretty much normal, those businesses that had success during the pandemic are now out of business. A lot of them are. They went up, they went down. So the world's constantly changing. The problem that I see, number one problem with that I have with academics is they teach you to think in one way, which is I'm going to tell you X and you make sure you put X on the te exam that I give you. And if you don't, you're wrong. Yep. And the problem is that's not the world. Because what is the right answer today, the world will change and it'll be the wrong answer tomorrow. And so what happens is students come out of school and they don't know how to problem solve. Why is it that student loans are trillions of dollars, or why, is, why are student loans one of the number one um, debt, maybe the number one debt in the United States per individuals? Yep. Well, if academics worked, then we wouldn't have all that student debt. Clearly it's not working because people are coming out and they don't know how to pay student debt off because they, they weren't taught how to do something. The other thing is, that I think the um, value of, of academics and degrees is getting watered down. More and more people are getting degrees. Like when we hire for a job, there'll be 100 people with master's degrees um, applying. So maybe like when I was a kid, it was less rare. Now everyone has a BS degree or a master's degree. Everyone's got it. So it's less valuable commodity and there are numerous, there's new majors every single year. There's 10, 20, 30, 100 new majors every year. So it's getting watered down. So the so that means that it's just like inflation, the value of a dollar is going down, the value of, of a degree is going down. But the value of education will never go down, okay? But it's the question is, what is the right form of education? Mm. In fact, like when you and I are hiring these days, and we'll talk about this later, I don't care if someone has a degree. I'm looking at their experience. Yep. And of course, there's someone who obviously like, I appreciate education. I've gotten, I have been blessed with the opportunity to get a lot of degrees, but my value, what I learned was probably 98% outside of school. So that that's my thoughts on education. I think bottom line is for everyone's out there, value education, but value in specifically the area that you want to be great in. 
And I don't think school teaches you that. I love it. Damn. I love it. That's a good way to start. Yeah. Um, so before we were at academics, um, we left academics to create ASPI, but that wasn't your first entrepreneurial journey. Uh, while you were in college, uh, probably high school, you, yeah. you and you and your brother, Dr. Gabriel Wilson, created ABC Bodybuilding yeah, at the yeah. time. So you've always kind of had this entrepreneurial spirit. So kind of talk about maybe the differences between like that entrepreneur route, then you went into academia, you were a professor, created an entire master's program, <clears throat> kind of from a business perspective was an absolute grand slam um, for the university, not, not, not necessarily for us, but uh, created an absolute grand slam because the program was a huge hit, huge success, and then kind of made the decision to go, you know what, there's bigger things out there, let's go do it. So talk about kind of your thoughts around that. Absolutely, well, so like you said, I've always been an entrepreneur, um, probably my first major like entrepreneurial businesses that I kind of built was similar to you. I th you had a paper route, right? Mm -hmm. yep. So we both had paper routes, but I, I had a paper as a little kid or probably like 10, 11. And that's what I learned how to really be entrepreneurial because you have to build your own paper route. So I was a little like chunky kid and you know, and I had to knock on doors and say, Hey, excuse me, do you want a West County times? We have a, a sale going on or Hey, I'll give you a free month. And then they would like it, and then you get them on a recurring, you know, <laughs> subscription, monthly recurring monthly, revenue. Yeah, right? I was doing monthly recurrence back <laughs> when I was like eleven. So, and the thing is, you learn a lot about that. In fact, Gabe and I were starting businesses. We were doing um, uh, really cool businesses, probably when I was a teenager, and we're, I mean, making like ten grand a month plus, um, you know. And I think Gabe probably was like eleven at the time, you know. But the point is that we were doing this stuff and you just learn like, oh, you find niches and you start to learn that you make a lot of sales and then it becomes less popular and you move on to something different. And yeah, then I, I did, we started ABC Bodybuilding um, when we were teenagers and going throughout um, college. And it taught us a lot about our writing and getting sponsorships and working with different companies. Um, so you learn a lot about being an entrepreneur um, and, but again, I, I, my dad really stressed education and I always did want to be a scientist since I was a little kid, I was doing science and the traditional route for that was academics mm. for being a scientist. And so that's what led me when I finished, when I graduated, um, with my doctorate was to go into academics and specifically university of Tampa. So university of Tampa where we met, mm -hmm. uh, um, actually, um, is basically that's where um, we had decided to, they had they had a normal undergraduate program and we had these big visions. You know, you come in just like we have now, we have these big visions to change the world and we have these big visions to change the university. We said, we're gonna start by building a graduate program. And um, of course, doing a lot of studies and we're gonna build a, um, a nationally renowned uh, research program. And we did. You know, we built a great research program. I think you, when you and I went to National Strength Conditioning Association, people were citing us left and right. You go to expos, people were citing us left and right. And we built a graduate program. And within the first year, uh, we did all the marketing. It was doing over a million dollars. So um, we brought these principles. And what we did is we start teaching students um, what it meant to think like business people, but also think like scientists at the same time, right? Um, in other words, like, hey, you need to be smart in a lot of different ways. And so we taught people how to think, how to create an experiment, how to do things in an ecologically valid manner. And I thought, we think we had a lot of impact on a lot of lives. With, without a doubt. And I think that lesson or kind of that experience that we went through, for me, kind of being young, very young in that process, seeing like when, when I came into the University of Tampa, our lab was literally a closet, like like probably smaller, smaller than, than this room, room. This um, room. had a treadmill, um, some filing cabinets, <clears throat> uh, and like some broken pieces of, of, of like exercise equipment. And they're like, here you go, this is your lab, figure it out. Um, and I, that was the moment that I was like, oh my gosh, this is what research is like. But I think you kind of knew you always had this vision in your head of it could be something bigger and without support 
right? Like it wasn't like, it was like, oh great, no. let's build you a lab, let's do that. They said, figure it out. Yeah. Um, and that's what you did. And it was like, hey, we're gonna figure out a way to build a bigger lab. And it ultimately got, it turned into one of the most renowned labs in the country as yeah. far as academics is concerned. And we built one of the most successful master's program literally against all odds because they there was zero support there. Zero support. <laughs> they, zero support. And and this is kind of, to me, what led to real, the realization of how academics work. So we spent so much time building that master's program. I mean, in, in internally, people are like, whatever, you know, you're, you guys are never going to build this program. It would take 20 years. And I think we, we had developed it for uh, two years. But we spent countless hours. I remember there's time, we sleepless nights putting together curriculum, putting together a marketing plan, doing all this stuff. And I could remember, of course, you were, you know, we're working internally. But I remember when the program got launched and we were at um, uh, an event and the, the dean was there, president was there, all these big people. And I remember the dean called up the chair of the department and said, hey, we want to congratulate you on all the work you've done, et cetera. So all this program got launched. It did seven figures and no zero acknowledgement whatsoever. And, um, you know, it, it was, it was, uh, it was, in a sense, it was like, wow, you know, it's kind of interesting that no real gratitude, et cetera, at all. And so there wasn't like they, the president liked the money, but, you know, it's just no real value that was like given to the hard work that we did. Yeah. And actually quite the opposite. We were no strangers to probably the dean's office. Oh. Um, I'll give an example. My first visit to the dean's office was we were doing a study um, at the time. And there was a participant in the study. She was female and she deadlifted. What was it? It was like 365. Like it was something. Away. It might have been 315. Something super impressive. A lot. Right. And she was ecstatic about it. And I was like, we want to share this. This was that time when like Twitter was like new. Instagram was like just a thing. So I was like, oh, let's tweet about this. So we had her sign off, had her approve. Like, yeah, you can tweet it. She was over the moon that we were going to share like, hey, congrats on like, it was the end of the study. And I remember you and I get an email on Easter, right? It was Easter? Yeah, yeah, I remember um, that. We we, get an, yeah, we, it was literally Easster. Easter. It was Easter, right? We were with our families who were just going in to, you know, for a quick workout. Quick so workout. Was, we get an email on Easter that we mandatory the next morning at 8 a.m. we were going to be in the dean's office. Yeah. And I, I, now I'm nervous because I'm a, you and I grew up where it was just like, oh my gosh, you're in, you're in bad place when you're getting called to the office. Mm -hmm. Like, And so he comes in. And like, I, I can't even make this up. He come, we come in, we sit down and he's like, do you understand the, what you guys just did? And I'm sitting there and I'm now I'm like starting to sweat. I'm like, I have no idea what we just did. He goes, you posted a picture of a university student. And I'm like, okay. Yeah, like, what, what? <laughs> and he goes, the, verbatim, he goes, do you know that that picture could end up <laughs> on a porn site in Malaysia, <laughs> and I'm gonna have to answer to the parent when they call and say that. And I'm wild. I I almost burst out laughing, but then I realized he was serious, yeah. and I'm like, oh my god, wild, this is how it's gonna wild. be. Yeah. And you and I sat there and just took a beating, beating from him about how you can't do this. We literally gave him had this had the thing from the IRB. Had a, he didn't care. Yeah. Did not care. But it was like this vengeance that he was out. And at that moment, I think was a turning point for you and I to realize like, this isn't going to be our forever home. Well, and, and it's like catch 22, because even to build a program, you have to market it. So the one time, I, I, probably a month later, um, I got personally called to the dean's office because of a, a uh, article in a magazine. Yep. Well, how are you going to, how are you going to market the program? You can't ever do this again. X, Y, Z. And so, you know, you see the walls kind of closing in and closing and closing in um, because, and the thing is all of that stuff's important. Yep. Like students actually need to see, this is my problem, Ryan, with the my one of my uh, major problems with academics. And you know, this was one of the major turning points for us. We went to a conference and um, like I said, my dad always taught me, hey, science could change the world. And I believe that, I believe that to this day. Um, I don't think academics gets the method to get there, but I think science can change the world. Well, 
one of you know one of our dreams um uh, was winning the the young investigator of the year award and at that time we went there and you actually got um uh you won an award for study of the year when you were back doing your research with um blood flow restriction yep and that same year i was blessed to get the young investigator of the year award at nsc and i was so excited but I went, I went, I went up there. I thought my dreams would have come true, and I looked out at the crowd, and I realized that the only people who really understand what we were doing were people in the crowd, other doctors, other scientists. That this method of complex writing, like when you write a paper, you write it in such a way that no one can understand it except people with very high levels of education in your specific field. And I was like, this method, all this stuff, it's not going to get out to the general population for a hundred years. Like you, listen, this, no one knows more about keto on, uh, than people who watch this podcast. Why is it that it took a hundred years for research about ketogenic diet and you get to the general po populace yep. because the system's flawed. So I knew up there looking out there, I was like, this isn't going to cut it. We got to break free. We got to get out of this and build something better. We, you, we looked at each other. We got to get out of this and build something better where we can automatically bridge the gap because we were being stopped from communicating with the general population. You couldn't do magazines. You know, um, you would get attacked by academics for like bridging the gap. If we had a podcast like this, it would be frowned upon. And um, forget that. I think there are critical moments in everyone's lives where you look back on and there are decisions that you look back on and it completely changes the trajectory of your life. And I remember after one of those visits to the Dean's office about you appearing in a bodybuilding.com magazine or something. Um, and it, 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 it was, you were like, I'm not even getting paid for this. I'm getting like, they don't even send me free protein. Like it's, I don't get anything for it. You were completely volunteer at the time. And I remember you <clears throat> left the D you were there for a very quick time. And you called me walking back and you said, we're done. Clean everything up. We're done. I said, what do you, what do you mean we're done? Like, I, I was just like, I was like, what do you mean? You're like, what we talked about, we're out, we're leaving. And you went on to explain about how there was ultimate, there was an ultimatum, really a decision of like, Hey, you can't keep educating people in, in the general, you can't outside of these four walls. You can't be educating on bodybuilding.com on social media. You can't be going on podcasts and doing things. You just need to teach inside of the classroom and that's it. You either take that or leave. And you said, where do I sign the line? I'm leaving. <laughs> and I think that was one of the best decisions we probably ever made in our lives. It was one of the best decisions. I think the thing to realize is it was a very, here's why it was difficult. You, you spent all these years, we built a seven figure graduate program. We had students who were coming from all over for it. But also on top of that, we built a multi-million dollar lab. True. Millions of dollars worth of equipment, like tons of equipment, technology. It took us forever to build that. And when we left, all that stayed with the university. And so what we had to do, we had nothing. Um, we didn't have any equipment. We didn't have the job, none of it. So that decision at that day was basically like, I'm going to make a decision to, we're going to make the decision to completely transform the world. And it's not here. Yep. And a lot of times I think people get caught up in like, oh, I've invested so much time in this, right? Or, you know, or I'm tied to this, you know, there's a ball and chain at whatever job you're at or what you're doing. If it's not right, it's not right. Don't keep staying there right? It's like quicksand. You're just going to keep sinking and sinking and sinking. You and I, I think, and th during that time, one of the things is you look, they, there's a good, great scripture, iron, sharp, iron sharpeneth iron. Um, that was one of the most stressful, but great building periods in my life. And actually one of the reasons why you and I are such, no one understands the bond that we have, but, but you and I. And the reason why is because there's so much pressure. When we left academics, there were so many attacks on us. It was, it was a your sellouts, all this, all that. And I, you find out. Let me tell you this, guys. At the end of, end of your life, you might have few friends. You people have a lot of friends. I'm sure. Oh, I have a hundred friends or whatever. No, no, no. You don't know your friends until shit hits the fan. 
Until something goes crazy and everyone's attacking you, you don't know who your friends are. And like the reason why you and I have such a strong relationship, because um, the guts that you had to stand strong, um, and I think us standing strong together in the face of the biggest amount of adversity you could ever have. Um, and we grew a lot from it. But as I said, that's why I think it's just people can't understand like w true friendships are forged under fire. Well, I couldn't right? agree more. I think there's so many lessons. There's so many, le we could do an entire podcast on just the lessons learned in that. Yeah. I think one is like, there is magic to the fresh start effect, regardless of how much it hurts. That goes yeah. in relationships and business and anything, right? Like we literally left behind millions of dollars of equipment two people who some of them were the ones shooting the arrows in our back on the way right. out the door, right. um, trying to literally tear us down from within. Right. Um, and then on top of that, you go into an environment where there was no guarantee. We didn't have anyone giving us a dollar. Mm -hmm. There wasn't a lab. There was just this idea in our head that we had been planning out for a long time of like, what if we just created our own CRO? Um, we didn't have any, it was jumping out the plane without a parachute, you yeah. know what I mean? And we did it and we left. And at the same time you're jumping, you have all these people on the ground who are trying to take, an take you down. Um, shoot everything you can imagine from posts on social media, trying to make podcasts about us, trying to claim things like, oh, you were kicked out when we left on our own fruition. Correct. Like it's like every single thing that you could imagine and you, at that point, I remember there was a very critical thing. I, I think I probably have it still on my phone. I remember we went back to your house at the time and we got like one of those like sticky boards that like you flip the pages and you can like rip it off and stick it on the, on the on a wall. And we got that up and we started writing out Aspie and we started drawing it up. And at that moment, um, we said, you know what, how the hell are we gonna do this? And a couple weeks later, I remember in your garage, uh, we were getting ready to train and um, a piece of equipment showed up and that piece of equipment you showed up and you we have a video of it somewhere. Tendo unit. A tendo unit. And you sat there and you're like, you know what? We just left the university. Um, we have this vision in our head of what we're going to build. And you know what? We have nothing but gratitude for everyone out there. Even the people that tried to and continue to shoot arrows in our back. We have nothing but gratitude because... Um, we think what this next endeavor for us is going to be bigger and better than we could have ever imagined. Absolutely. And you know what, going back to that, I actually, one of the most thankful experiences in my life, I thank the Dean for calling us up. I thank the person who wrote the letter to the Dean to personally get us attacked. Um, I thank all, everyone who did attack us because I have the most gratitude for them because that's actually what made us. 100%. You know, that's so the thing. A lot of here's what I think a lot of times people think, oh, woe was me. Things are hard. Oh, oh, woe was me. Like, um, I, I had to leave my job. Good. Woe was me. Something didn't go good for me. Or great. You know, um, woe was me. You know, uh, my girlfriend broke up with me. Awesome. All of those things are, are things that build you. It's almost just, it's like, it's like saying this way. If I go to the weight room, if I don't go to the weight room and lift weights, when I go to the weight room, it's painful. It's very painful. Good. That's what makes you grow, right? So every single time you get punched, if you didn't have any of that, what would you be? Soft. What would you be? You'd have no skills, no adaptability, nothing. So every single hardship that you have in your life is the best lesson. That's that's the arsenal you have. It's the power you have. It's the strength. It's the adaptability. Every lesson that you learn. I see so many people, something bad is happening. They go in the corner and get depressed. First off, like to me, like I've deleted the term depression from my vocabulary. I don't use disempowering terms. I'm overwhelmed. What do you mean you're overwhelmed? You're weak. You know? Oh, I'm depressed. I, I'm not saying depression is not real. We've published studies on it, but I'm saying I t I'm telling you the term, but in my own vocabulary, it does not exist. So it's just like it, to me, like if I wake up in the morning, if I'm um, if I'm not um, if unless I'm getting ready to die, I'm very happy, right? And so that's my thing. All those things that we learn are the best things. I'm extremely grateful. 
it's the, they're, the, they're the greatest teachers in our life because all the hardships they provided gave us the tools necessary to be where we're at today. It's incredible. And I want to talk a little bit more about some of those things today because I think there's been so many lessons we learned leaving academics, creating ASPI. One of the questions I have for you before we, we jump into ASPI is over the last decade, um, we've learned a lot in business. What would you say are some of your biggest lessons you've learned in business <clears throat> about leaders, choosing the right people on your team, things like that? Well, number one thing that you have to have in business is a high standard for yourself. You need to have extremely ridiculously high standards. So what is that standard, right? What is the standard that when you're a kid, all the way through adulthood, all the way in business, that's going to make you great? For me, I think the highest standard you can have is God. I'm a strong Christian, whatever you believe that's, you know, whatever someone believes is their choice. But my dad actually brought us up strong Christians and we had to read the scripture every single day. But what happened? If I was like, every time I felt lazy, I couldn't be because I had a higher standard. If you look at the United States of America, it was built on that standard. In God we trust. What does that mean? We have a standard. We can't be lazy. We need to work hard. There's no entitlement. Look, I'll tell you what, when I, listen, I open up the scripture, it goes like, you don't work, you don't eat. You're not, it doesn't say you're entitled to eat. <laughs> yep. Nothing in the scriptures, it doesn't say, it says you don't work, you don't eat. So I took that with me. So what I'm going to say is that the first thing you need to have a higher standard and that's business. So every, so the first thing, if someone's going to start a business and you have employees, you're at people, set a high standard. And sometimes people aren't going to, at the beginning, they're not going to like that. But if they, if they understand that standard exists, they're going to see success and they're going to go to another level. The other thing is, yes, it does, whatever your vision is, the people that you hire have to align with it. You know what I'm saying? Because if they don't, it's not fair on them and it's not fair on you. If you and I, um, you know, are texting each other at 4 a.m., 4.30, 5 every single morning talking about breakthrough research or new business things, um, people who work for me aren't going to under understand that. So you need to hire people who are hungry, who have a similar vision, who want to grow with the company. Um, I think that's that's key. Because people will kind of rise to the level that they're at. Water seeks its own level. So I think let's just say you, and this is actually something that is very scary. You could have someone who's a, a go-getter and you could have someone who's not and they'll fall to the level of the person who's not. Mm. So it's important to understand that like you need to set a standard for everyone. You need to, everyone needs to, um, you need to have a lot of team meetings that bring people to that standard. But I'd say that's the first thing in business is is your standard. The next thing is in business, I would say is people talk about a lot about hard work, but like when, I think when you set a standard that's constantly before you, um, it drives you. Hmm. Um, so obviously businesses have a lot, business, and we talk about this with businesses, how much, it, there's a financial part of it. You need to bring in certain revenues, right? Well people need to understand there's two major components to that in business. Number one, it's um, what are those targets? If you set your targets too low, what happens, you'll never surpass them. So let's say that a company says, oh, my goal is $500,000. And they're busting it behind, they reach $500,000 in the first three months. All of a sudden, they'll go flat. They won't make any more. It's like, I don't understand, I started off so good in the year, and at the end of the year, I'm only at 550000 because you said your goal was 500,000, you reached in the first three months and now you're, okay. So no, you need to set, so, so those standards need to be quantifiable. I think that's kind of the other thing too. And then the next thing I think that you and I have learned in business is that um, you have to bring unique value to whatever, whatever company that you're in or what you're going for. So you have to analyze what's the competition. If there's, Tons of people doing exactly what you do, you'll lose. Red ocean. It's a red ocean. You're just going to lose. So you have to find, how can I bring unique value? The more people you help in a unique way, the better your business does. 
So those are some of the some of the lessons that um, you know I I definitely learned. I love it. All great lessons. I think things that people can apply for themselves for their businesses. You could even apply those kind of in relationships. Oh, yeah. Um, same, hundred percent. Yeah. Same, same concept. One of the things that you and I have been talking a lot about recently is when developing team dynamics. It's viewing it. We're both sports fanatics, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? Formerly played hockey. Yeah. I formerly played baseball. But you have to treat a team or a company or a business like a championship team. Like you're going out to win the championship. And that's going to mean that you have to put put the best team forward on any given night. And people who rise to that occasion will thrive and succeed. People who don't, as a team, you need to make a decision to go, our goal is to win a championship. Yeah. I love you. It's not ill will. It's just it, our goal is to go win a championship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that's been one of the biggest lessons that we've learned for sure. building different businesses. Um, the other one that I, I want to talk about was you and I very early on made um, investments, some that have completely failed. Um, other ones we've learned when you bet on yourself, that's a, it's a great bet. <laughs> um, but we bet we made some investments early on. And I'd say one of the biggest lessons we learned is betting on the jockey matters right? So finding the right jockey is everything. So you, if you find a good jockey, someone who can go out and they just figure it out, they have that work ethic, like you talked about, relentless, nonstop pursuit. They don't think things should just be given to them just because, oh, I need more money or, oh, you know what? It just didn't work out. Sorry. Like you want people who have skin in the game because they're going to go and fight when things get tough. Um, but it doesn't matter how great the product is. If the jockey stinks, that horse isn't going to win. Exactly. And the jockey's got to know that, hey, here's the investment dollars. Once those runs out, you better figure it out by then. 100%. You know, and we've had, we've invested in companies where like, we've invested in the wrong jockey, jockeys and we've invested in companies who are invested in the right jockeys. But the, you need to make sure that they have those, they're hungry. And, you know, they're relentless, just like you say. Agreed. 100%. So let's, let's talk about Aspie. Let's dive into Aspie. Yeah. Um, Aspie, Applied Science and Performance Institute. So we leave academics. We create arguably one of the greatest institutes in the world focused on scientific advancements. Everyone thinks it's like, oh, that's where sports happen. We, we actually have uh, a huge sports team coming this week that we're going to be working with, and we do that. But we also are deep <clears throat> into anti-aging, longevity, things that we'll talk about later on. But when creating Aspie, like people go, how'd you do it, right? Like how did you guys create a 20,000 square foot facility that does multi-million dollar research all year round? How does that, how does that even happen? Well, yeah, man, like you said, I mean, Aspie's a really interesting, um, it's a really interesting business, really amazing thing. And I think um, we originally did build it for sport, you know, and in, in, in performance. You know, I, I told you, for you, those of you guys who haven't watched, like, um, if you are guys who are sports fans, um, and I know, like, boxing is probably um, on people's tip of their tongues because the Jake Paul fight this <laughs> weekend, right? Um, but that just happened recently. Um, but anyway, we, um, well, as a kid, I know I personally watched um, uh, Rocky IV. And, and when seeing the Russian in that laboratory that was in, it was a huge inspiration. So, and I think you and I... Uh, created something that was way better than that. But how you do is just basically everything that you just said. I think you have to understand that like in a business, you want to create unique value. So what you and I wanted to create research that could bridge the gap and help people ultimately. And well, what do people, what do people need? People want to live longer. You know, um, uh, we want our parents to live longer, right? Um, people uh, don't want to have cardiovascular disease. People want to perform better. It doesn't matter if you're an athlete. No one wants to be out of breath walking up the stairs, you know? So what we did was we created Aspie. We, uh, uh, we built, brought in a lot of scientific equipment, everything like that. But we understood that we have to target areas with the greatest amount of value. That's what, that's all a business is. It's vision, hard work, and value. So we mapped out, um, okay, what are partners that we, we talk about them as partners. 
People talk about CROs, which is like a clinical research organization. We talk about partnership research organizations, okay? That's what we are. We partner with firms who want to help people. And the more people you, you help, the greater the contracts become. It's that plain and simple. So it's like you don't even have to worry about the finances in a sense. Obviously, that's what a business is. You can think of business as money in. But the bottom line is that if you focus on the value component of things, the contracts happen. So we look to partner with companies that are looking to build value. You know, look at, um, take one of our partners that we worked with that, uh, you know, if you look at, um, well, obviously, let's say Ron Penna. He's a person who's done a lot in the field um, in terms of low carbohydrate space. And he wanted to um, uh, bring soluble corn fiber really to the bar market. So w- that could help a lot of people. It's in so many different keto ice cream, so many different keto bars. So we partner with him to show that, hey, it doesn't have a glucose response. You know, it, it could help with uh, gut bacteria, the, you know, and all these things. So we partner with him to help that. Um, and that's helped how many uh, millions, millions of people are having that. Yeah. Obviously, um, partnering with Brian Underwood. Brian Underwood is one of the, maybe I would say he's the number one CEO in the world in the low carb keto space. Uh, and Brian has a wildly successful company, you know, with, with Prove It. What does he do? All he focuses on is bringing value to people, right? So I think as a company, we do our research in areas that can help people. And when you do that, um, contracts come. But I think it's like you said, we started off as pure like that, those types of studies to now ASPI has developed a lot of intellectual capital and a lot of patented technology uh, to where now we're building um, things um, with Aspie Health and stuff like that, which can actually help people anti-age. A hundred percent. And before we talk about Aspie Health, I want to, people don't realize like we didn't get some huge investment. I wouldn't, we, we, we took zero we got, dollars, no, we zero no dollars investment. of investment. People always ask us, so how is this funded? Yeah. How, we figured it out, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, we sold research studies yeah. and partnered with companies to do some of these studies to make this happen, right? Um, and there's been a lot of lessons uh, ups and downs across across that journey. Um, one of the things that I want to touch on really quick, because I think it'll be uh, interesting, is so we we started with research, right? We were we thought, oh, you know, we're going to do this sports science for specifically and only for athletes. Yeah. Um, so we also ended up buying a division um, that did training and worked with athletes, did NFL combines. And on paper, that's sexy. You yeah. know what I mean? Like some of the best athletes in the world have come through Aspie yeah. from the NFL Combine. Um, and it wasn't until you and I, uh, one day, we look at, uh, we, we get this this thing in the mail and um, it says, hey, uh, your loan's due for $500,000. And I'm <laughs> like, C- come again? <laughs> oh, <laughs> what God. The, what the hell just happened? Uh, and unbeknownst be known to us, uh, there was a huge loan taken out um, because the training division was bleeding. Oh, like, yeah, yeah. That thing awful. was bleeding 50 to 75 grand a month. Yeah. Um, and you and I were just so focused on research that we trusted other partners to like yeah. run that division, which yep. was a big lesson for us lesson. Uh, to learn is like, you can't let people, you can't take your eyes off of something and then all of a sudden you end up with five hundred, seven hundred fifty thousand dollars in loans, you're like, where the hell did this yeah, come yeah, from? Yeah. Um and, and it's due. And it's due. it's due. And you gotta figure it out. You have no idea. Yeah. You yeah, gotta you figure, figure it out. out. Um, which is crazy. But uh everyone thinks like, oh that must like athletes must pay a ton. I think a good example <sighs> of why pay. they don't is uh I remember this vividly is we're sitting there and we're going over NFL combine numbers. And you and I could care less about this because it's like it's peanuts yeah. compared to what you and I are focused on in terms of research. Are a loss. They're an absolute loss. And you and I are sitting there and it's like, well, they want food. They want supplements. They want training. They need housing. And you have their agents who are taking a risk and bet on these kids thinking, well, you know what? I might have to shell out 10 grand 
and this kid may not get drafted. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. or he might get drafted lower, yeah. and so I'm going to get less of a commission. And I remember one time we were sitting in the office, and this athlete, I won't, we won't say his name, but he is a huge NFL star now, oh, enormous yeah. NFL star right now, and his agent was a complete asshole. Oh god, um, awful, person. and a complete asshole. And so the person who was running the division at the time was like, you know, try, he'll pay. He's good for it, man. He's good. Let trust him. So we front out all this money, pay for this kid's housing. And this happened on multiple different Absolutely. individuals. But this person just comes to mind. We pay for all the housing, pay for all the supplements, pay for all the food. And the agent basically sticks up the middle finger and goes, screw you. He goes, I'm not paying a dime. You can come to New York and get it from me. Blah, blah, blah. And we're like, oh, I remember that. Are you kidding me? That's like awful. And this is a big name guy, big name, um, agency and at that point you and i looked at it and we're like cut the whole thing cut it cut cut it and yeah. it was probably one of the another one of those moments that's the best decision we literally just cut the training division overnight and we're like we're done exactly. i don't want to deal with this this is a headache it's a nightmare and so sometimes it sounds sexy on paper and you got to cut it well and, and here's the thing that, and here's a big lesson for you guys to learn if you guys are starting a business you understand the forces that are coming against you right and in, in, think about it. Technically, we could have millions of dollars worth of research equipment, but you could have a guy who's just got out of college who can train a, 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 a NFL combine player. That's yeah. your competition. It means you, everyone's your competition. And when everyone's your competition, there's price wars. And when there's price wars, you will lose. So I think that's why one thing you need to work with stable firms and governments if you're going to do athletics, that's why, for example, with you and I, with Aspie, that's why we have um, been talking and doing a lot of work with um, uh, more governments and stuff like that. We're doing stuff right now with like Saudi Arabia, you know, um, when, and speaking with Abu Dhabi and things of that nature. These are people who are great people. They have huge visions um, and they understand that it takes resources to build something that's larger than where we presently are at. So again, I think, um, and of course, someone who just graduated whatever, who doesn't have any equipment, they're not gonna be able to work with a government, right? Yeah. So that's again, in business, you need to find a point of differentiation and you need to be able to bring value where others can't value. It's brilliant, great advice. Now, what would you say, makes ASFI research unique? Like what are some things that we do that other CROs don't do? Like what focus on quality, um, how we collect data? What are some of the things that you say are unique? Well, I think the biggest thing is we look from the perspective of um, the everyday consumer. Okay, so for and a lot of it's based on our own families and friends. So it's almost like when we're looking at stuff, we're like, hey, how would this help me? And how would this help my parents? Um, and so that's the first thing is we look at from an applied standpoint and we design studies that take a practical approach. Um, take for example, someone might come up to you and go like, I have this ingredient and I wanna do this really complex brain scan to prove to the world that it's helpful for people. But in reality, what are you going to show? Are you going to show that on a label? Hey, taking this supplement increased fMRI, you know, activity. Who? No one's going to buy the. No one's going to buy your product. And more importantly, you're not going to be able to change people's lives. Correct. So you're going to end up spending a lot of money. So the first thing we do is we, it's telling the company like, hey, look, you 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 really want to help people with this product. That's why you got into this, right? Okay, let's design an experiment. Who are you trying to help? Well, you know what? Um, is a lot of people, you know, as you get older, um, you know, you're not as energetic. Okay. So let's focus on things of energy. Let's focus on energy and vitality. Let's get those measures. Because if you really believe your product's going to help people, we need to investigate areas that can help people. And then when it actually turns out, if it does help the person, now they have a marketable claim that, that, hey, this is proven to help people. So I think that gets it to more people. So we design experiments that test claims that are applied. And when they're applied, they have a much more rapid capacity to spread throughout society. 
So I think that's um, what makes us unique is that we have the end user in mind. And we will tell people like, this point, it's not going to really help people. Yep. So I think that's one of the things that makes you, the next thing is that we truly are partners. We always look at the perspective, like we want to help change people's lives. And so if people are aligned with us on that, we will turn, turn it down. We'll turn it down. We don't want to take on partners who, who aren't actually trying to make that impact with people. So I think a lot of what we do is coming from the heart. Um, and that's, that's an error. Whereas other like CROs, I don't care. Bring, I'm, you're as long just, as you're paying the cash, yeah, it's fine. As long as you're paying cash, you're just a number, and here's the data. Uh, buy, you know. And most of the time, the data is trash. And most of the time, it's the data collected is trash. poorly. It's collected poorly. It didn't look at what they wanted to look at, um, and uh, that's the problem. Yeah, right. It's super interesting. Um, I, I will come back to Aspie and some of the anti-aging longevity stuff with with health. But you mentioned, you talked about family uh, and how mm. that's kind of the root and and driver behind what we do. Uh, one of the things I wanted to break bring up is uh, when you and I first met, w there was always this, I'd always asked you, hey man, like, what are you thinking about starting a family? Like, like what are your thoughts? Like, um, and you were always nervous to like, be like, ah, you know, I don't think anyone's ever like ready, ready, but you're always nervous. What do you think drove some of those nerves of like, you know, I don't know if I'm ready to, to have a family, have kids, like what drives that? So I will say this and it's admittedly so like I don't have, a, in, in life I don't have a lot of fear on things, but when it came to having kids, I say it's probably my number one fear. Okay, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> not gonna lie, yeah. that's my number one thing. And I think what drove a lot of it drives the fears is you, you and I have always been, uh, I don't know, free spirits. We kind of go where we want to go, do what we want to do, create what we want to create. If we have to get on a plane tomorrow and fly to Abu Dhabi, you know, or Saudi Arabia or wherever in the world, we have to be able to do it. And um, we've always known that, like, if you're going to really change tons of lives, you've got to be able to have um, flexibility. And so um, it's almost like the, the, the fear of always settling down and having kids has always been like, am I not going to be able to do this? I think God, let me say this. We'll talk about the anti-aging stuff later. But I firmly believe God put you and I on this earth to stand before kings and transform war countries. That's like, that is the, and, and remember, okay, you you can go ahead and have this video, just like the video we had on Aspie. We, w we have already stood before kings. We will transform uh, countries. Or we'll transform the, the, the world in terms of like health and anti-aging and longevity. But to do that, you need flexibility. And so that has always been my concern. Okay, can you do both? So I think in order to do that, I think the most important decision you could ever make in your life is like the person who you spend the rest of your life with. You know, besides, besides me making a decision to trust God, you know, the most important decision I can make in my life is obviously, oh, who are you going to marry? And so um, basically... It, it's, I didn't think that you, someone existed that who actually understood that, hey, sweetheart, I got to work. You know, hey, sweetheart, um, it's like, for example, it was Thanksgiving and my birthday's on Thanksgiving. Family's coming over everything. I didn't have a birthday. I didn't have, I didn't, I, Thanksgiving was a meal and it, that's our lives. But you have to be able to um, marry someone or be with someone who actually understands that. That's the, that's what I was. That's what God put us on this earth for. Things aren't going to be easy. We are going to make sacrifices, and you need someone who can understand that. You need someone who's basically, basically going to say, "I understand, sweetheart. Like I get. I understand you have to work. I know what you're doing. I know. I know the visions that you have, and that's okay." And so that was the first step. So for me, obviously, recently I, I got I got married. Um, uh, to Isabella, the girl, my dreams. Um, but the thing, the thing about her is she's the first person I could see myself having a child with. 
because the second component of things is, um, I think, um, you know, like, man, what do you do? You know, and all this stuff. <laughs> How do you hold this thing? <laughs> what are you going to do? You know, I can, mm-hmm. t- I can tell you my idea of like what I think I'm supposed to do with this kid. I'll tell you that. But like all the other intangibles, like the motherly stuff and like the, the intangibles and stuff like that. I, I listen, it's I'm a fish out of water and she's not, you know, so she she's like researching tons of books and setting setting up the, all this stuff. She knows that she's very comfortable like that. Just like you and I could talk business. She can talk about this stuff and she understands like I got this and you got to do what you got to do. And that diffused me. It made me feel like, OK, wait, this is possible. And the other the, the third thing I think that's very important is to understand is that you need strong people in this world and um you just do and so strong people need to have kids <laughs> you know what i mean so i i feel like so one of the things that's hit me i think recently um when you look at like great i read a lot about history i'm big time into history so you read about a lot of great kings like Charlemagne, like, uh, um, you know, uh, the C- various Caesars, you know what I mean? Um, Alexander the Great, um, uh, all all these things, um, you know, or his father, Philip, all of these great conquerors understood that they had a duty to their bloodline. So I think one of, you know, my hero is my, my father, you know, um, and he, um, my dad worked and grinded and toiled and slayed and worked whatever. He's the smartest guy I've ever met. My, my dad is a genius. He's one of the smartest people I've ever known. But I feel like also like, man, I have a duty to my bloodline. And when I got kind of that grasp and that realization, um, I re- and, and, and I got into that. Like I, I could trace my bloodline back to kings. You know, if I go back and look and my dad taught me, I have a duty in my bloodline. And so I realized that like, um, I just like with business and leaving ASP, leaving, um, uh, um, the university, I got to set that aside because I have a duty to my bloodline. I have a duty to my dad. I have a duty to my ancestor. I have a duty to my father in heaven that like, we got to carry this on. And so now I can now. I realized that having a kid is like the best way to um, change the world. You know, you can keep that going. So those are the things that got me over over that fear. I love it. And I think I remember when you kind of told me like, hey, we're, we, we might start trying. And I was like, oh, man, that's that's all. I was pumped. I was super excited. And I was like, dude, you should go get like uh, a semen analysis, right? <laughs> I was like, we should see where you're at, how things are going. And you did that. Um, talk a little bit about the results of that and how kind of like it was like, oh, shit, what do I need to do now to try and give me a, give us a better shot? Yeah. So I will say this, like the thing is like, okay, when, let me say this, if you're a business guy and you don't sleep much and you're constantly under stress, uh, obviously one of the repercussions of that is going to be fertility, right? Yep. So, uh, the, so one of the things is like when I got that analysis, it basically said you can't have a kid. Like, I mean, it was like the thresholds up here and I, it was, it was you know what I mean? Yeah. So obviously like, oh, um, when I told my wife, she, she was, um, sad. Um, but basically it just said you can't have a kid. Now this was, um, last July. Um, cause that's when we were starting to try. And, um, so obviously, you know, like, um, you hear these horror stories of people who can't who try for years and they just have had friends who uh, they they it's just very sad. It's disheartening. The funny thing is that um, I've been in these situations like my whole life. Um, you know, I, I've told you stories about my dad. I'll tell you. I'll tell you, This is what this is actually my whole life, and this is your whole life um, as well. What we've seen, the things that we've seen, are are miraculous but like um i'll tell you like a story and then i'll apply it to this but a story i'll never forget but um 
my dad told you education was very important. And we grew up, when we first grew up, we initially grew up in a poor neighbor, neighborhood, which again, I'm extremely grateful for. Um, is one of the best things that, that could have happened to me um, because my, I saw my dad and my parents understand how to get out of that. So that was a big lesson for me. But, but, um, but anyway, we obviously, you, public schools out there, no, 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 no. If I, I went to those public schools, we, we wouldn't be here today. I certainly wouldn't be here today. I, you know, I wouldn't have the education, et cetera, because they were not good. They're just not. So my dad's strong Christian, and there's a private Christian school. And um, we cannot afford this. I'm telling you right now, no way. So what's my dad do? My dad takes me and my brother, um, and, and um, actually me and my brothers, and puts us in this private Christian school. I'm trying to, I'm trying to even put like in perspective of like what that is. Like you, you can't put someone in a school that exceeds your monthly salary mm -hmm. and it's for all of your kids. So anyway, my dad's like, yeah, well, I, um, um, uh, God, you know, you look at Proverbs says like to, to, um, get wisdom and, and, um, with all, all that getting, get understanding. So he says, okay, I'm going to put you in, um, in this Christian school because this is what Proverbs says, what God says, he will provide. Anyway, puts us in this school. My mom's like, oh. But he just, that's just what he does. He's just going to do it. So you can't change his mind. Puts us in this school, of course. We can't, we can't afford it. So anyway, dad starts getting calls. And then we get the, the notices. Hey, you're not, you know, X, Y, the, the bills are piling up. So my dad goes to pick me up from school and uh, um, he's got to go to work. He's going to pick us up and bring us home. And there's like a big telephone pole, huge telephone pole. And um, these two girls are standing next to it. And there's a big hill. Um, it's like a, it's on a hill, the parking lot. This car, I guess, brakes went out. It, it loses control and it's it's going to smash these kids. They're talking to each other. It's going to smash them. They're they'll they'll they're going to one of them's going to die if not both of them. I mean it's coming that fast. My dad sees it, pushes them out of the way on the ground, then just picks us up and leaves. N like nothing happened. Um, uh, a few days later, my dad gets a call, picks it up, and and um. Uh, the person on the call is, hey, it's uh, Principal Wells, Mr. Wells. Everyone was afraid of Mr. Wells. He goes, hey, it's, it's Principal Wells. And my dad's like, damn, here it comes. He goes, hey, Floyd, um, uh, I want to let you know those kids that you saved there. My dad didn't like tell anybody. He goes, yeah, I, I, I do. He goes, um, one of them was my daughter. And... I mean, that's just, it's one of the biggest things that, that has ever happened to me. And, and even today, it chokes me up. It chokes me up because I know that, that you know, God is with me, right? Mm -hmm. And it's probably like, so, so, and I'm just getting choked up right now. But the main thing is just to realize that, like, I realize that nothing's impossible, right? Nothing's impossible. Um, uh, there's a good verse like nothing is impossible um, in Christ who strengthens me. So anyway, going back to today, um, so I got the results and I quoted the verse. I told my wife, nothing is impossible through Christ who strengthens us. Anyway, that was last July, right? You got those results. Um, the results said you can't have a kid. That's what the results said. Um, my wife's due to have our first child July, I think, 16th or 18th of this year. Amazing. So that was a year ago. So uh, the the point the point is um, that the point is that I want to say is that like um, I think in business and life, uh, whether it's something physiological, um, you can't, um, you know, that's why I go back to like business. You need a higher standard, right? Um, because like that was a miracle, you know, and obviously can I give you tips for fertility? 
Sure. <laughs> I can give you tips for fertility. Like, hey, you know, obviously you need to, you need to make sure you get rest. Um, you, you can't sleep for it. And you need to make sure you start getting rest. You need to get all this stuff. Um, and, and you know, um, you got to modulate your training and things of that nature. But, um, but ultimately, a lot of it comes down to faith, you know? It's incredible, brother. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. You're I think, welcome. I think it's incredible. Your dad's an incredible human being. And I yeah. think that story will probably inspire so many people that we'll never meet. Um, yeah. But also, just the power of prayer, belief in a higher power, right? Yeah. Standard. Um, yeah, you can say, I know you were like taking a zillion supplements. You're like, dude, start taking yeah. Boron and yeah. and this horny yeah. goat weed or whatever. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> whatever it is. But the reality is like a that that's not what's gonna do it. You know, and no. there's there's a belief, um, and you guys tried, tried and tried again, and now we're eventually gonna see a little man running around here. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a couple a couple of months. It's crazy because, like I said, dude, we started trying in July of last year, um, and uh, we're having a baby in July of this year. I mean, that's a quick turnaround. It's a quick turnaround for you know. So you know what it was? It was it was my wedding. That's what I, I in think, October. Yeah, yeah, that's what it was. It. I set he you said, guys up, and that was it. <laughs> I think it. My, I think it was what I think it was. Oh, I think man. it was the wedding. <laughs> no, it's incredible. I think. I think I know you're you're still probably n still have nerves, but there's no doubt in my mind. I know Isabel is going to be an incredible mom, but I know that you're going to be an incredible dad. Thank you. I appreciate that. I'm super excited for little man to make his appearance. Eventually, he'll be sitting right here <laughs> having, yeah. having his own podcast yeah, exactly. episode. Um, but man, I'm, I'm so happy for you guys. Thank you. I really so. appreciate that. Building off of that, uh, I don't even know how you can build off of that because that's so incredible. Um, Let's talk animals. So yeah. we're, we're in the family realm still. Yes. Uh, you talked about how to optimize, have kids against all odds, right? And now that miracle is happening. Um, let's talk about animals because you and I both love animals. Um, they're like before human children, they were like our children, right? They, they, they still are. Let's talk about why do you have this? I talk about the Wilson Zoo, but like you have this need or energy to like not just rescue animals, you rescue the animals that like everyone else would look at and be like, that animal's like on death's door. You know, yeah. like it's like with Manny, Daphne, at Darley, you got the two cats. What's what's the reason behind that? So um my brother Gabe and and myself and um um uh we basically even my, my brother Riddell, but basically my parents raised us to really love animals. So there were times where we had like, we, we grew up with boxers and cats. There were sometimes we had, must have had six boxers and like three cats all at once. Sm not, not like a huge place or anything. But my parents always taught us that like, um, hey, if you um, if you treat your animals right, you know, it's, it's it. you can always kind of tell the character of a person by how they treat those who are innocent. So for me, it's almost, I'm trying to tr try and think of the best way to describe it. Um, you and I have been faced in so many situations in life where like, again, leaving the, the $500,000 thing, which is a drop in the bucket to the things that you and I have faced, um, you know, leaving the university and a million things that we probably can't even talk about. Okay. But there are situations where you're hanging on by a thread. And um, it brings you to the realization that um, uh, in, in one moment, everything can be gone. And who are you relying on then, right? It's people who are, people who care about you, people who are kind, you know? Um, and I've always believed, I've always believed that um, uh, if you can help people who are, you know, um, can't do it for themselves, that you'll be taken care of in a sense. That's what my dad always taught me. And that's people. But I think a good uh, sort of allegory for that um, or scenario for that is animals. Uh, so so basically that that's the kind of the backdrop perspective. They're innocent. They can't help themselves. And um, so I like to 
make their dreams come true um, is my biggest thing. It's like, I want to take an animal who's hopeless and like give them uh, uh, the greatest life, you know? And, and so that, that's kind of, that, that's the concept. I don't know. That's, that's what it is for me. It's like, man, you can show active kindness to something that's helpless, you know, they can't do it for themselves. So what we do basically, uh, Isabella and I, we will go and find animals that are in the greatest, um, need and who no one's going to pick and have the most problems. Now I'll say this, there's a lot that comes with that. A lot. <laughs> I mean, the bills on uh, our animal bills are insane. They're, they're nuts, but that's, that's what we do. So like basically, and then of course, the second reason is this is a scientist in me. Okay. Is that it's also a, a great way to show that what you can do in physiology. So like, for example, let's take, um, Manny's kind of one of our greatest examples that we have, but like Manny was a beagle. He was like, uh, um, eight years old and he was in basically in a kennel his whole life and he had no real human interaction. His previous owner kind of just would just open up the kennel door, put in food. And so he didn't have good social skills and he was completely out of shape. And quite honestly, um, I don't think he, he probably, he probably would have died in within six months. He was obese. He had cognitive problems. And so basically we adopted Manny and, um, we adopted his sister at the same time, Darla, but Darla was very skinny. She was skin and bones, had no hair. She couldn't even go outside. Um, she was very skittish and terrified, um, and malnourished. So anyway, we, we rescued them. Well, Hey, the point is you can take this dog and do everything that we're saying to do, everything you say to do with what the fat and what we talk about every day on ketogenic dieting, um, we're gonna apply to this dog. So, so we did, we took him, we put him on a low carbohydrate diet, we home cooked for him, um, which is like basically like, you know, ground beef. Um, and uh, we, we did, uh, uh, people do different things. Some people do raw diet and that works amazing. I know it works great with Scoot. Mm -hmm. um, Manny has like a really big appetite. <laughs> so we had to kind of like put, but he likes vegetables. He'll eat vegetables. So we, we you kind of have to keep to his appetite. So we basically cook ground beef and like um, green beans and, and a bunch of grains. And so that was um, the diet we put him on. Manny went from being obese to being incredibly athletic. You know, where he looked like he, he went from being like, uh, he looked like he was on his deathbed to looking like a young puppy. And uh, we, we were able to transform him. And what are the principles that we used? Everything that we talk about. We went on a low carb ketogenic diet. He intermittent fast. We do uh, sprint interval training with him. You know, so basically, and, and the way we do that um, is you get a bone and have him chase you. <laughs> you put it in your back pocket. Put it in my back pocket mm -hmm. and I'll run back and forth. He's actually done sprints at Aspie before. Um, and, uh, so he'll sprint back and forth on the turf. He gets really excited. And so that's sprint interval training. So everything we're saying to do, and he radically transformed. Right. And so I think, um, that, so, so that's, that's the, the, the kind of the main reasons that we have an opportunity. We recently adopted another animal who's at a, who she came from a puppy mill. Her name's Daphne. She's a work in progress in terms <laughs> of like, uh, you know, but she she was emaciated, yeah, you know, and she, I mean, off just she looked totally emaciated. This is interesting because now with this is a lesson for everybody here, but for you sometimes you have people in your life they just don't want to move, they just don't. So Daphne does not; she likes to sleep all day long. So I realize I'm gonna get one burst of energy from her a night. Usually it's when I come home; she gets very excited. Um, or if like, um, you get like a wet rag, I've just discovered this in the last week. Um, if you kind of like, you kind of just wipe her face and everything like that, or wipe her fur, like you're kind of giving her a bath, you know, when you, dogs get a bath, they go wild. Yep. So even her, and once I get her excited, she likes cheese. She likes Gouda cheese. That's her favorite. So you put a wet towel on her, you give her a Gouda cheese and she'll chase you back and forth. 
And so, so with her, what even studies show, it's not necessarily, the, it won't, that if you just do interval training, that's like everyone watching this guys, if you, if people who are watching this, if you don't have time, you have five minutes mm -hmm. in a day. It's like you talk about, you always say it's like, no, you have time. It's what you're prioritizing. I know everyone can prioritize um, uh, uh, five minutes. In fact, this morning I was very busy and I didn't have time. Why well, I had to walk the dogs, but that was earlier in the morning. But like when I came home, I didn't have time to train or anything. So I literally put the treadmill up to a high um, level and sprint it, put it at a speed where I was basically had to jump off within 45 seconds because it was a steep incline and high speed. And, uh, and, and it, that, that sprint right there is actually going to do a lot for me. Everyone can do that. Everyone's got 45 seconds. Everyone's got a minute, right? So I think that's the biggest thing. What I've learned with these animals, they have different temperaments. Manny loves to go for walks. He loves to do, as long as there's a bone involved, he loves to exercise. Daphne does not. So, but she's got a minute in her. So you can do high intensity training um, with her and that's going to bring her a lot of help. So just like humans, you have different, um, you know, methods that you can, tools that you can use. Incredible. So there's obviously a lot of love and a lot of scientific experimentation a on, lot. Our, on our animals. A lot. Uh, and they're on uh, everything you can imagine. Yeah. And so talk about some of the supplements. Cause the, yeah. I'll, I'll preface it. So anytime there's something new that you'll research, I usually will get a text or a WhatsApp <laughs> and he's like, Dude, you got to get this. Like the one uh, is like UC2, right? UC2. So UC2, everyone's everyone's animal should be on it. But you're like, dude, UC2. I'm like, all right, how much to give them? Like, and granted, Scooter's like 20 <laughs> pounds. Yeah. Right, 17 now. But like he's, he's, I'm like, how much should you give him? The bottle, now this is for humans. The bottle's like one pill per day for humans. And he's like, just crack open a pill, put it in, put it in. I'm like, really? He's like, just do it. So we've been doing that. So it's wow. just like, it's super, super it dose it. of UC. Oh, incredibly for his arthritis. But Same um, with Manny. talk, talk about some of the supplements that you have. Mom. And this goes back to our original point. Like what makes us different as a company? Like Lonza is a massive pharmaceutical company that we're multi-billion dollar company. One of the ingredients that they have, um, um, they have is uh, UC2. Um, and uh, they've had a lot of research um, and actually they found that it helped with dogs. Mm. Um, but, uh, um, and we know it helps with humans. So basically I doing all this research, I'm like, well, the dogs also have, you know, arthritis and stuff Scoot did. Manny was having some problems with his left leg. And what I do is I, I did mass dose it, you know, and, and, and man, it, was, it did wonders on him. But like the supplements that I use on the animals is, um, I will, I give them, um, uh, basically NMN for anti-aging. So basically if you guys know, and I'm sure a lot of people, you're probably one of the few audiences who have heard of NMN out of 99.99% of podcasts, this is probably one of the few ones that people might know what it means. Basically guys, you guys all know, and I'm sure Dr. Ryan's talked about this, but as we age, um, you know, um, NAD levels lower. And NAD is very important for maintaining mitochondrial function, um, which is everything. Um, and uh, NMN basically um, increases NAD levels. So the, all the dogs get NMN every night. Um, they also I help, want to get help with their uh, brain function because as you age, you know, you, you, we have an aging brain. Now, the thing for everyone to understand is that people... We'll get into this more, I know, later. Um, but uh, a lot of times you have a single blood test or um, whatever, um, uh, methylation test, um, and you have these individual tests. Well, the thing to understand for aging, oh, my biological age is this. What most people don't know is that your cardiovascular age could be 30 and your skeletal muscle age could be 70. And... Um, every system ages at different rates and that is a fact. Okay. Um, and so basically just understand that guys, like when you're dealing with anti-aging, um, a single test might say, is going to, might tell you like some average. Okay. 
but every system that you have will age at different rates. And that's, everyone knows genetically, it's different between everybody. So NMN is a more of a holistic anti-aging type of thing. You're treating kind of the root problem of aging, which in large part, certainly mitochondria is behind that. And then also do you, you have cognitive declines, which obviously mitochondria is important for that too. But um, we'll, I will give the dogs um, phosphatidylserine because that um, is important for memory, um, which we know declines with age. Um, and we know things like phosph uh, phospholipids are very important um, for brain function and memory um, and also stress regulation. I'll also give them ashwagandha um, because that is important um, for, uh, it's an adaptogen, it's important for stress regulation. So I noticed like Daphne had a lot of stress, so we, um, she, was, she seemed depressed. Now she's not. Um, but ashwagandha is very good for things like that. You always need to stay in a good state, so we give them that. These are things I take too. Um, uh, I, I think one of the biggest things that is important for anti-aging is I do give them ketones. So like um, I'll take like um, Keto Nat uh, from Prove It and basically um, uh, the dogs like ice cubes. You guys are, I don't know how many you guys have animals, but dogs, a lot of dogs like ice cubes. Scoot doesn't. He doesn't he's, like He's a pain. Cubes. He doesn't. Okay. I have to sprinkle it on his food. Okay. Like okay. Gravy. Okay. Yeah. But most do. Most yeah. do. Keep yeah. So, well, Daphne obviously can't eat uh, um, mm -hmm. that so I, because she didn't have any teeth. <laughs> <laughs> Poor thing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I have to, that I have to sprinkle on her food. But the, um, yeah, so I give them ketones. Because ketones are um, um, antioxidants, they improve mitochondrial function. Um, they are anti-inflammatory. All of those things are um, um, counter-aging. Um, now, so those are the things that I, I, I give them every single day. I know with Scoot that you have a lot of things for his muscles. Yeah, the only other I I don't do ashwagandha. I think I'm going to add that in. I do all the others with him. The only other two that I do is or three actually. I do a salmon oil um, oh. for his coat. Oh, that's um, good. So I I alternate between coconut oil and salmon oil um, just for his coat, especially now with the allergies. Um, so it's like he gets real itchy. So salmon oil or coconut oil, um, and that obviously coconut oil has a lot of other benefits as well. Um, I do um, fertilized egg yolk, which oh, yeah. that is for his muscle, right? Super, yeah. super big for muscle. And they make an animal version now. Um, Maya, Myos makes that makes yeah. that version. Um, and then I also do CBD because uh, he's oh. got super high anxiety. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. So I do do a peanut butter flavored CBD and I have to sprinkle that, that oh, okay, all over great. his thing. And this, his food is like this like weird concoction yeah. of supplements and raw food. <laughs> yeah. I use that on uh, 4th of July. Yes. <laughs> The, yeah, the CBD. Have to. Yeah. Have to, right? So incredible. I think I think there's a lot that hopefully people can take away on animals of like what you can do for your animals. I think it's, like you mentioned, I think it's the same similar principles to what we would recommend for humans, right? Yeah. Move, eat a lower carbohydrate diet, make sure they're getting in protein. Most people don't know. And at some point we'll get um, Ron Penna or Yemeni Mesa on here um, who's doing a lot with uh, legendary foods and some of these other companies that are creating lower carb um, kibble, so to speak. Oh, but traditional great. kibble is like 70, 80% carbohydrates. Like we know in humans what happens when humans eat 70, 80% carbohydrate yeah. diets. Yeah. It's very low in protein, but not only that, they're going to become insulin resistant very quickly. Yeah. But yet we go to the store, we buy this huge bag of traditional kibble for our dogs and feed it to them and wonder why actually dogs are living a lot less than they ever have before. Yeah. Um, and so it's like, well, they need to get back to kind of ancestral tenants of eating meat, lower carbohydrate diets. I don't understand. <laughs> like every time we go to the vet, um, and Isabella usually the one who takes them, but like the vet will tell her like, you, they need grains in their diet. Really? Every single time they need grains in their diet. Wh what, why does a dog... You, explain to me why a dog needs grains in their diet. It doesn't make any mm -hmm. sense. Like, even physiologically, it makes no sense at all. Like, how do you come up with that standard of care? With it's, the same, it's the same thing with traditional doctors, though, right? I'm, I'm super fortunate because our vet, 
I told her straight up, I'm like, he's going to be eating raw. Um, I said that he's on like a low carb ketogenic diet. And she actually was just like, that's great. Love I, it. Yeah. Um, and she's like, the only thing I want to do is we're going to do um, twice a year, we're going to do blood work for him. And every single time I just got his blood work back, she's like, blood work looks fantastic. Keep up the great work. Yeah. And I'm like, he's going on 10 and yeah. his blood works great. Yeah. Right. Exactly. And so it's like, it's going to take a little bit of time to change these people over. I just don't get the concept of, I don't even know why anybody needs grains anyway. You know what I mean? The only thing, the only case that you could potentially even make is like the high level. And of course that's debatable on athletes. We can, we can get into that, but it's, it's debatable. Um, it is debatable. In fact, our research shows that you probably you do. don't. Um, but it's the only case that you could make for like, Hey, I can use a lot of carbohydrates because I'm burning thousands of calories a day. You know what I mean? So I'm using carbs as a fuel. But why would why does a dog need carb grains? In fact, why do humans need a lot of grain? To, you know, unless you're expending thousands of calories, is where you can make a case. Let's t let's go to that level. Let's let's go there. So what? What is the necessary amount of carbohydrates, um, or what is the recommended amount of carbohydrates? roughly um, give examples maybe of what you might recommend for people to consume does it depend on their activity level their level of insulin sensitivity obviously there's a lot of factors that go into it but do people need to be consuming five six hundred grams of carbohydrates is there ever a need for that absolutely not i don't see i don't see it ever a need there's not, never a need for five six hundred grams of carbohydrates the only case that you can make for it is someone like michael phelps People who are like, okay, I'm swimming six hours a day. Well, guess what? They technically could use it as a fuel source, and it the the but that's the case. That is one point one percent of the population, right? And even then, there that you may not need that. So, how many carbohydrates do you need in your diet? Uh, I mean, none. Now. Now, th what I'm saying is the reason why I'm saying that, so it's so, so you don't need glucose. Well, technically, your body can make carbohydrates, all the carbohydrates that you need for your needs. It's, it's a fact. If I'm on a ketogenic diet, my blood glucose levels are normal. You know, um, so, th so, and in fact, intriguingly enough, we found this, we did research. We found that when you're on a ketogenic diet, your muscle carbohydrate, because we, we went to conferences and people pointed their fingers and yelled at us, you need carbohydrates because it's the main fuel you use in high intensity exercise. Our research showed that you actually um, have normal glycogen source. Glycogen is the stored form of carbohydrate in your muscles for everyone listening. You actually make glycogen uh, in your muscles without carbohydrates. So now what I will tell you, so what, what I will say is I think carbohydrates can be used as a tool. I'm not anti-carbohydrate. I'm using carbohydrates for what they can be used for, which is a tool. So I think they can be an ergogenic aid. Um, like, and, and so for example, like, you know, I might, if I'm going to work out, if I'm maybe going to do a leg workout or something like that, I might have, uh, I could have 20, 30 grams of carbohydrates or something, bef you know, around my workout. And it, what happens is I'm so insulin sensitive. And my brain's not used to the carbohydrates that it gives me almost a caffeine effect. And because my workout's going to be an hour, we actually pu we actually published a paper with Jordan Joy, um, uh, Doctor Jordan Joy. Now he did his first dissertation, but basically what we found was that when you consume carbohydrates in small amounts, like I said, 20, 30 grams before you work out, you don't get out of get knocked out of ketosis. So it could be, uh, uh, and actually in that study, the one thing sometimes that we see that could be impacted sometimes is like peak power output. And that study, when you did the pre-carbohydrate, your peak power output in the keto individuals stayed peak. So, um, so that, that is um, a, a, a tool. So I think using carbohydrates as a tool is a good thing. So basically you can use it as I would say as a tool, as it necessary. Now, um, you know, the question is like, how many are really necessary? I mean, I, listen, I, so I think bottom line is that I would minimize carbohydrates. What our studies told us is maximize carbohydrates and minimize proteins and fats. I would just switch it around. 
like the recommendations that they have for proteins, probably switch that around and have that for carbs, that and below. So that's probably the highest amount that I would have. You know, if you look at the recommendations that they have for protein, they might recommend like 80 grams, 70, 80 grams a day. That's probably the max amount that I would say is really needed. And then probably um, below below that. Um, but I definitely would never say um, over 150 grams of carbs, um, 120 to 150 grams. That's like, to me, high, high carbs. You know what I mean? Now, would that recommendation change? Because one of the things that we'll talk about here in a little bit is some of our recommendations that we're going to make for the masses, right? Longevity, anti-aging. For us, it's more about how do we get people to become more carb conscious? Correct. Um, so like in when we're talking masses working with governments, if we can get the their country Correct. to eat 150 grams of carbohydrates, that is an enormous win. That's the point. Um, but like when it comes to uh, athletes, is there a need possibly, or people who are concerned like in, in the muscle PhD world, there's a lot of people who are interested in bodybuilding. Like if that is the goal of trying to put on more muscle, does it warrant more carbohydrates? And it might not be necessary, like you mentioned. Um, can they get away with maybe a little bit more than the average person or do they need it? Okay, so athletes definitely get away, away with more than the average person. Um, like, you know, we're, okay. So tomorrow, um, the uh, Phoenix Suns, um, their general manager and vice president are coming. We're gonna visit with them for um, uh, most of the day tomorrow. Now, why are they coming tomorrow? Well, they just got um, uh, Kevin Durant, you know, one of the greatest basketball players of all time and uh, probably the best player in the game today. Um, and everyone is saying they did it for one reason. They want to win a championship. This is a serious team. And um, so they're coming to us uh, um, to, um, make, to have the best sports science program, and not just in basketball, but in the world. They're serious. Well, if you look at NBA players, and they can eat a couple hundred grams of carbohydrates a day. And NBA players, now granted, um, anytime you, get, you talk about a professional athlete, the professional athletes obviously are the top human humans in the world as far as physical capacity. I talked about Michael Phelps, one of the most elite physical specimen, gifted specimens in the world, a guy like Michael Phelps. We, we worked with the Tampa Bay Lightning um, during their two Stanley Cup champions. You look at Steven Samkos, all these, um, um, you know, Victor Hedman. These people are some of the most gifted people in the world. And they can handle a lot more carbohydrates. But like I said, NBA players, they could eat three, four, 500 grams of carbohydrates in a day, some of them. Um, but I'll compare and contrast that with the NHL in a second with, with the Tampa Lightning. But their body fat levels... Um, have gone down actually over the years. Like the people who are being drafted on calipers are probably around 6%. Oh, wow. Which means uh, on DEXA, they might be 11, uh, 10 or 11%. Lean. Yeah, lean. Wow. No body fat. And they're eating a couple hundred grams of carbohydrates. Guys, I know this is the extreme. But if you go down the levels, NCAA, a lot of basketball players, we were with NCAA players, they can get away with a lot more. Um, and because they're training for hours on end, okay? So like even when I was training, personally, when I was training my hardest um, in grad school, I was training three times a day, I probably can get away with, and I'm, I'm genetically, I don't handle carbohydrates well, but I actually trained my best at anywhere from 150, probably around 150, 200 grams of carbs. Now maybe I have anywhere from, 30 to 50 grams a day of carbohydrates, maybe 60. Um, and, uh, but I work out, you know what I mean? But it tells them my range. I went from now I'm 30 to 60 and I train pretty hard, but then I was training extreme. I could go up to 150, 160 and be very lean. Mm -hmm. Whereas someone who's can handle carbohydrates more, maybe their baseline's 150 and they might be able to be as athletes go up to 300, 400, 500. Now, um, we did research. We compared people who are doing ketogenic dieting and resistance training compared to people who are on carbs. They both gained the same amount of muscle. And the ketogenic dieting group lost more fat. So th there's a case for that. But as far as muscle, I would say let's go beyond our study 
anecdotally and stuff like that, I think people feel like they get bigger pumps when they lift weights. Um, you know, they, you know, they feel like maybe carbohydrates can help with immune function when they're training. There's some research that shows like, Hey, up increasing carbohydrates when you're, um, doing overtraining can help your immune system stay intact. Now, guys, what I'm going to tell you is that is use this to your advantage. What we're saying, it's all within your range, right? It's all within your range. So again, for me, if my average is 30 to 50 grams of carbohydrates um, or 30 to 40 grams, maybe if I feel my immune system being taxed, I can use it as a tool. I may be able to go 60, 70, 80 grams of carbohydrates for a day. Usually the next day, I feel like my immune system's right back intact. So, but I'm using them as a tool. I'm not dependent on them as a lifestyle. But so to answer your question, I, th I think that it can be used as a tool for athletics. But again, Jeff Volick, his research has shown that elite marathon runners there who are ketogenic have just as many carb glycogen stores as those who aren't. So, but the ones that are using them are healthy because they're in a situation. Why do carbohydrates, why are they unhealthy? Because if I have no activity, if I have the, the we're working with um, countries in the Middle East right? The average steps in the Middle East might be 3,800. The average steps in maybe the United States are uh, below 5,000. They're in the 4,000s. You take your average person in the United States. I'm getting 4,000 steps a day. Um, okay, so what am I using those carbohydrates for? What are they doing? If I'm not using their, their fuel source, not using for a fuel source, what do they do? They get stored. They fill up your liver source. They fill up your muscle glycogen source. And they're the first thing that gets burned as a fuel. So now I'm sitting down doing nothing. I'm not burning them as fuel. They're the first things I, I burn. That means every time I consume uh, any fat, it's just going to get stored. On top of that, if my muscle carbohydrate stores are full, um, I'm going to start also now store, storing uh, a lot of triglycerides in my muscle. That's going to lead to inflammation, impaired signaling, and, um, and, uh, a lot of inflammation, a lot of joint pain. I'm not even working out all the joint pain because I'm not using carbohydrates for anything useful. So you can make a case for it if you're an athlete or if you're an avid exerciser, um, I don't think they're bad in that case. Now with that, there are some people who say the type of carbohydrate doesn't matter, right? If it fits your macros. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Does it matter? And I know we've we've done some preliminary testing on this, but like if someone says, all right, cool, I'm going to get 100 grams of carbohydrates. Does 100 gram of carbohydrates matter if that comes from things like vegetables or even like oatmeal uh, versus like I'm going to eat a Hershey's bar, a Rice Krispie treat and two donuts to try and fit my macros of that yeah. 100 grams? Would there be a difference there? So the concept of if it fits your macros is basically says that the general premise is that it doesn't matter where you get carbohydrates, proteins, as fats or fats, how you space them out it doesn't matter as long as that you hit a certain macro threshold. Your body sees carbohydrate, um, and uh, it just sees oh, carbohydrate is carbohydrate. So I can get that from a Snickers, I can get that from um, uh, a sugar drink, um, a soft drink, a soda, uh, or I can get it from broccoli um, uh, or oatmeal. Your body just sees carbohydrate. So the answer to that question is that's absolutely false. It's unequivocally, overwhelmingly false. And the problem is that people do all these anecdotal things and go, oh, look, you know, this guy just ate, um, this guy ate one meal a day and it was donuts for like uh, 12 weeks and he lost a bunch of weight. Well, look what happened. He ate one meal a day. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> and before he was eating donuts, pizza, you know, ice cream. He cut those out. Now he's only eating donuts. You know, stupid anecdotal anecdotes within the framework of a good theory. I th I'm not against anecdotes, but you need to put them in perspective. Yep. Um, so studies basically show that's false when if I eat oatmeal versus if I eat um, uh, Gatorade, well, my insulin levels are going to be far higher. I'm, I'm going to drop. I'm going to be far hungrier. It's a fact. 
low glycemic index foods, the foods that are higher in fiber, make me fuller, more satiated. Um, and they tend to have a lot more micronutrients as well. So it's foods that tend to be higher in fiber are usually denser in micronutrients. So I think that's kind of something important to sort of understand. So what I will say this is the more carbohydrates that you have in your diet, the more conscious you need to be about the quality of those carbohydrates. Great point. Quality matters. Quality matters. Right. Quality matters. The same goes with protein, right? And we've done studies on animal-based proteins versus plant-based proteins. Yeah. Quality matters in terms of the response and the ultimate benefit. Hundred. So my brother uh, Gabriel uh, Wilson, who also uh, is with, is with Aspi now, um, but anyway, super smart guy, and Gabe for his um, for his dissertation, actually looked at the quality. Um, he was looking at two things. Um, it's interesting because he was looking at. Um, uh, when you spill over, like how many carbohydrates you take and when do you start to spill over and have negative effects? Um, and uh, he was also looking at um, quality of, car of proteins. And right now there's a big movement on plant proteins. Um, and I know that you being a scientist did your own experiment on that. Um, and it's interesting because, you know, Ryan, I mean, Ryan's, Ryan is, um, we, did, we did your ASME score and Ryan is prime. You know, Ryan's, um, you know, body fat levels in the 99th percentile as far as being lean. Your cardiovascular performance is off the charts. Every number is is very high, is outstanding. But you put yourself on a vegan diet for a long time. And so, and I'm telling you right now, Ryan did every, you did everything. Tried, yeah. Yeah. I did. I mean, Ryan ate more pea protein and <laughs> rice protein than you could imagine. Yep. And at the end of, how long was it? We did four weeks. Four weeks. Lost muscle mass, gained fat, your cognitive performance went down, all that stuff. Yep. Okay. So that's pretty controlled, um, you know, and he did everything. I mean, look, every science you can do, give this a shot. Now- Gabriel basically did the same thing, but he did was he gave um, whey protein and he compared that to a uh, vegan based protein source. And um, which is in this case, it was wheat protein. Hmm. Um, but anyway, uh, what he found was that um, uh, basically the ones on whey gained muscle, lost fat. They had the same amount of protein. The ones that were on, um, oh, and by the way, the interesting thing is like on these things that they're eating a pretty like lean diet because they'll take them basically and kind of um they put them right below somewhat maintenance this is an animal study they put them right below maintenance uh calories because they want them to eat the whole meal so you can control the exact meal. Yep. Yeah. and even with that the ones that were on the uh, vegan based protein were fat they were skinny fat. So their body fat percentage was really high. They were skinny fat. And the only place they had more muscle was their calves because they were so fat. Wow. So um, uh, it's interesting enough. That's why I like, um, uh, that's a whole other topic. Obviously, you see people who ha tend to have more body mass have bigger calves. Yep. Same concept. Anyway, what was the mechanism? The mechanism that Gabe found was that um, the way the higher protein quality um, triggered um, protein synthesis and that made your muscle work harder and that made they had more mitochondria. So a big trick to having more mitochondria is protein quality. And that's what Gabe found. Now, intriguingly enough, when you add BCAAs, um, then you, um, you actually can uh, uh, reverse the effects of the low quality protein. So some of you guys are vegans and if that's your choice you made, it's the choice you made. Um, uh, you have to supplement with essential amino acids or branched chain amino acids. It is a must. I'm telling you right now. How would those recommendations change if someone's sole goal was fat loss? They wanted to maintain muscle, but like, I just want to lose fat. So for fat loss, I would say stick with two uh, reps. Per here's here's a rep range I would stick with for you, or eight to twelve reps one day, twelve to twenty on another day. And your rest periods on the 12 to 20 are going to be 30 to 60 seconds. Rest periods 8 to 12 might be 1 to 2 minutes. 
the thing that is gonna change for you is, you're gonna actually wanna do more supersets and giant sets. So what do I mean by that? Ryan and I, we um, when we achieved our greatest strength, I mean, Ryan and I got to a point where we were really, we had to- Those were the days. We were monsters. Yeah. I mean, we were lifting total volume, I think some weeks over 200,000 pounds of total volume. Um, and uh, we, everything that happens to Ryan happens to me and vice versa. We tore a quad at the same time. Everything happens at the same time. But anyway, it was one day we were like doing squats with um, 365 um, for hypertrophy, like sets of eight to the floor. We That's when we tore our quad. But anyway, um, uh, giant sets. We used to do giant sets all the time. And we did, when we were trying to get lean, we did this giant set where you did squats, like for 12 reps. Then you would go, so you do normal squats. And then we went and did safety bar squats. That's where you have like a bar like this for 12 reps. Then we would do leg press for 12 reps. And then we would do leg extension for 12 reps, maybe 20 reps and leg curl for 12 to 20 reps. And um, it was awful. And rest a minute. Yeah. Then we would rest a minute and, and do, go it do it again, again. and then do it again. <laughs> We got to find, like, there's a program um, that we wrote up. Man, if you could post this or anything online, yeah. it I will tell you right now, it would kill a normal human being. Mm. But anyway, this is what we did. My point is, try to, don't do that, but do, don't, <laughs> don't do, do what we did there. But do supersets and giant sets. Yeah. So basically, let's say you do, do, like, a set of 12 on squats, then do walking lunges, and then do... Um, uh, you know, leg press, but just do, you know, stuff like, or do walking lunges, superset it with leg press, just keep your heart rate elevated. I think circuit training can be really good. You know what I mean? So, you know, like if, if you're a guy, maybe you do bench press and flies or another thing, Ryan, that we think that can work too is let's say you're doing multiple body parts. If you're doing chest and back, you could do your chest and then you do back and never rest the whole workout. So I think that that combining exercise is a great way to lose fat. A lot of it's about efficiencies, right? Especially for people, I think we're living in a time now where people don't want to be at the gym for two hours, no. right? And people don't want to work out for two hours, which is what scares most of them from working out in the first place. So whether you're working out from home, whether you're working out in the gym, it's like I look at it as like, what's the quickest way that I can get the most bang for my buck and get in and out, yeah, right? Yeah. Whether that's you know, we, we do Peloton stuff. So it's like, yeah. if I can get on a Peloton and crush it in 10 minutes and I'm out, I'm I don't done. know how you, Brian done. puts up the numbers that you put. <laughs> I don't know how you, the numbers you put up, I have no idea. Like I'll do Peloton in the most, maybe every once in a while, like I'll see a 1000 or something. And there's, there's no way you can go over. Maybe I'll get like 1200 every once in a while. That's like, a, you know, or I'll get like 99th percentile. But then you look at these guys who are in the one percentile and they're freaks. You're, how are they getting this one percentile? I'm training pretty hard. And that's Ryan. <laughs> Ryan gets in this one, competes against the one percent on, on Peloton. The number is like, when you go, next time you watch Ryan, he'll put up a number. you go, oh, I got my Peloton. You see that as I got, I put in a Peloton. No, 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 look at his number. And then when you do a Peloton, look at the number you got. You, you feel really small, okay? Because like, I'll go, oh man, you're really great. Like a 99th percentile. And then I look at my number, I look at Ryan's and I'm like, the guy, your numbers are insane. Oh, thanks, man. I think I am I just love competition, right? Yeah. So for me, it's like, how do I push past mental barriers? That's like, I want to give up when there's three minutes left. Um, but it's like, I'm here to compete, yeah, right? Yeah, so exactly. it's like, I, I compete. I like set this bar. I'll be like, I want to be top 100, or I want to be top 50. Um, like if I want to be top 50, I know I'm going to have to get off to a good start. Otherwise there's no shot at me getting top 50. Um, and so it's like, I got to crush it from the beginning. And I know by the end of it, I'm going to be gasping for air, wanting to rip the shoes off and just lay on the ground for the next five minutes. But I think there is something to that because I think it's hard to replicate that, which is why I think it's important that if you can train with a partner, I think that's great. Yeah. But 
there's like behavioral science that goes into some of these things where leaderboards, competition, things we're going to actually be implementing in some of our software uh, in the future. But some of these things where you can see like, oh, I'm competing. People love to compete. People love to be on a leaderboard. Like, I think that brings out another level that you otherwise wouldn't be able, like, I wouldn't care to probably push that hard if it was just like, oh, I'm just going to go for a 15 minute Peloton. I'd probably hit it hard, but me seeing I want to crack top 100 makes me push harder. Yeah, it's, just, it's insane. <laughs> you don't understand, like, the, cr the crack the top 1,000, these are freaks. If you crack the top 100 or top 50, I mean, these are the freaks <laughs> of the freaks. Thanks, man. You know? But, but hey, you know, it's a, it's my hat's off to you, man. It's Thanks, insane. Man. Thank you. Yeah. Um, speaking of, of cardio, what's the best type of cardio for fat loss? So, okay. So, we've looked a lot of cardio. We've looked at cardio for longevity, and we've looked at cardio for fat loss. You can decouple the two. Um, there are components of cardio that could be great for longevity and not necessarily cause fat loss. And there's components that overlap. If we talk about, if we're going to talk about um, <clears throat> fat loss, um, I do think having an element of interval training is critical for fat loss. What we discovered in the literature is there does need to be somewhat of a volume component to that. Now, what do I mean by that? Um, when I woke up this morning, if I do like a 30 to 45 second sprint, that is outstanding for longevity. Um, but it might not necessarily make me get super lean. Mm. Whereas if my volume, like on a Peloton, for example, um, when you get, hit that 10 to 15 minute threshold where, you, where you're bringing yourself in interval. So what an interval is basically is, let's say you go all the way to the top, then you might come down for a second all the way to the top, come down for a, a little bit, go all the way to the top, back and forth for 10 to 15 minutes where to, when you come off, you have nothing left. That would be an example of um, ideal for fat loss. Now, let me say this. Ryan and I have both done wind gates. Wind gates are one of the most brutal things ever. But like, um, as it, it, when you do an all out wind gate, it takes three to five minutes to recover. You can't do that on a Peloton um, because if I were to, if I were to go all the way out to where it took me three to five minutes to recover, I'd be recovering. So that's why I mean, you have to bring yourself to an extreme, but, um, then you're going to come down for a few seconds and go back up down. But obviously you're, you're, you, there's a pace, yep. but the pace is when you come to the last bit of that 15 minutes, then there's nothing left. Okay. Um, that is what's best for fat loss. Now. Um, what I will tell you is this, is that if someone doesn't like that type of interval, there's a, there is a combination to say like, well, I, you know, I, I don't, I can't do what Dr. Ryan does. I don't want, I just, I, I, I prefer like, um, I prefer steady state cardio. Now that can make you lose fat, but by all means. So, and that's great for health. So let's say you're going to do 30 minutes, 60 minutes of, um, uh, moderate to low intensity cardio. And you're kind of in a zone and you're watching television. That won't be as beneficial for health, but you will lose fat. Absolutely. And you'll get leaner. Um, but one way to stoke the fire on that is, let's say like this morning, say I was going to go walk the dogs and I don't have time to do like a, a I wasn't going to do like a Peloton or something, but I have to walk the dogs. And um, well, if I did that 45 second sprint, study show it raises adrenaline and adre adrenaline is one of the most potent fat metabolizing agents out there. Mm. So for example, back in the day, um, uh, you know, back in the nineties, for example, uh, um, you know, w when you talk to like, um, anyone who comes out here, talk, talk to Yemeni when he comes on here and know all, all the stuff that happened in the day. Right. Um, but they had the ECA sack, which was basically led by, um, ephedrine, um, uh, or the, um, herbal equivalent, which was ephedra. Well, that's basically a sympathomimetic. It's basically like mimicking like adrenaline. It's binding to the same receptors. And so, well, you can get your own dose of adrenaline. You do a, you do all out 30, 45 second sprint, your adrenaline's up. And studies show that if you, when you go on that walk, you'll be burning more fat the whole time. So that, so, so I would say number one is going to be what you're talking about, Ryan. Number two is going to be like, um, uh, 
if you do the moderate intensity, low intensity cardio, start it off with one sprint. If you only do a bunch of intervals, then just do one interval at the beginning. Then do your low intensity. And then number three would just be low to moderate intensity cardio, steady state. That would be in order of the best for fat loss. I love it. And I think you triggered something when you were talking about like, oh, if you want to just get on and do steady state cardio. I think most people probably who are listening to this either are just starting to train or there's a lot of people who like know the benefits of exercise, know the benefits of training, but just can't bring themselves to do it yet. Yeah, yeah. Um, one of the things that Katie, I think her name's Milkman, talks about in that book, How to Change, I want to get her on here as well, um, is habit stacking, right? So like some people love to read. So what she did is she would say, all right, I'm only going to allow myself to read when I'm on the treadmill at the gym. So it created this habit of like, great, she loved this thing of reading and just paired it with the movement of getting on at the gym. Like for me, it's like if I, I hate treadmills, but like if I'm ever going to get on a treadmill, that's my time to like catch up on Netflix shows. Um, so it's like, I'll put my Netflix down there and that's my time that I watch Netflix. It's like, I'm at least moving yeah. um, at that time. So that's a good strategy. Are there any other it's strategies? Strategy. That you, yeah, I that love you that. Have? And it's movement, right? right? So you do a basic strategy for someone who don't want to exercise? Yep. Yeah, I think movement, if you're not exercising, study show that the threshold for actually making, improving fitness is like three miles an hour. Well, wow. Yeah, so so like if you don't exercise, the threshold for you getting health benefits, longevity benefits, uh, aerobic capacity benefits, anti-aging could be three miles an hour. Okay. So you go on a treadmill with three miles an hour, you're watching Netflix and you're anti-aging. So I think that is putting in perspective movement is move, movement is movement, but I think it's more getting putting in perspective like um, you talked about is that study basically where they had people who were um, uh, they were professional cleaners, right? Mm -hmm. um, janitors, maids, and and stuff like that. Um, well, actually, both you and I. Um, you and I used to like strip floors and and clean, we used to clean whole apartment stores um and uh that's actually how i think about it when i do it would take me like um eight 12 hours to clean a whole store with the crew and so i was like oh, that's a i got paid like 100 bucks to do it yep but i was like every time you think about putting in perspective like you're spending 100 bucks i think about the 12 hours yeah. on the floor grinding grinding right. on yeah. you know but anyway my point is but i was really lean while i was doing it and so my point is cleaning the house is activity that's actually activity. So it's like a lot of times people let their um, dishes stack up. Like think about this for a second. When I'm standing and I'm cleaning dishes, my metabolism's up. So a lot of people's like people you'll will go in their house and they have oh I'll clean dishes tomorrow. Why not do it tonight? You'll actually burn more calories. You know what I mean? Uh, if you my number one tip is going back to the animals. If you don't have um, a dog, get one. Just for a month straight, get up and walk the dog every day for a month. After a month, even if you don't want to walk, that dog will wake you up. Okay? So, like, um, my dog Darla, uh, 550, I hear her pacing around. She she's she paces around. She Then I finally get up. She walks to me. She walks to the door. She walks to me. She walks to the door. She walks to me. She walks to the door. Meaning, come on, Dad. Take me for my walk. Eventually, you'll have a partner who will, who will have you walk, right? So, um, but you have to train the dog to want to walk. If you sit on the couch all day with it, you have never trained it. But get a dog, they'll train you to walk. So I think that's good. Cleaning is a great thing. Yard work is a great thing, um, et cetera, et cetera. And I think if you have kids, it's a great opportunity for them to get active, right? Go for a walk with them. Make it fun. Well, right? it, Make it fun. It's a great point. So one of the things is like... With this kid, I know what a I know what a guy is going to have to go through in this world. But so he, you know, basically, look, you're going to go on the playground, and at first, the kids are cruel; they just are. You got to be in great shape. You got to be in great shape. You need to have a competitive advantage. So, like, I growing up, one of the things my parents did is they put us in martial arts, right? So when we were kindergarten all the way through college, we did martial arts. We we um, competitively fought and everything like that. So for me, it's just something that helps me with my confidence. I know I have it and stuff like that. It's always in my back pocket. 
Um, but it's so, but what I'm doing right now is I'm now just going back and practicing all those skills. So, but I saw, so but I get up in the morning, like I'll, I, I get up in the morning and I'll throw 500 to a thousand punches every morning. It's just what I do in the quiet times. I'll go, I'll take my dogs for a walk. I'll throw a thousand punches. And so, um, you know, the, so, but I, I trained myself to do that growing up. But the reason why I'm doing that is I know I'm going to have a kid. Yep. So I, I know I need to make sure my skills sharpen for him. It's brilliant. So yeah, so it's, it is a great. And great with point. kids, I think a lot of it can come down to like gamifying it. So I was in New Jersey recently with Bobby. He's seven. Um, and like he's sitting on the couch, right? Watching probably Mr. Beast on YouTube or something. <clears throat> and, and he's sitting there and, and I'm like, you know what? I got to get out. I got to get moving. It's a dreary day. It's new middle of nowhere, New Jersey. And I'm like, ah, oh, how am I going to get, how am I going to get this kid to move? Um, and maybe he'll inspire me to move. So I, I was like, you know what? I was like, oh, I'm, I'm going to go on a race. I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to catch something up, up the street. And immediately he like perks up. He's like, what are you going to go catch? And I'm like, oh, I'm going to do this race to the stop sign. And, and I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to head out. And I just started putting my shoes on. He's like, can I come? He's like, oh, I want to come to a race great. this outside. And like, he had no, I, if I would have been like, Hey, I'm going to go do sprints up and down the street, no interest. But the fact that there was like this game of like, we're going to find something, we're going to race. And we raced to see who the first one to touch the stop sign was. Of course he won. Um, <laughs> so, uh, let, we, we did that and then sprinted all the way back. And it was just like, he got up, he moved. He would have never otherwise done that, but there's a sense of gamification. That's fantastic. Too, you know? Um, so I think you need to have yeah, that. Yeah, I agree 100%. I want to get into the anti-aging because we've been talking a lot. Um, one of the questions I want to ask quickly, because I think it's a something that people often just have a bad idea or, or don't quite understand is like, if, I don't think people quite understand there was like this whole thing around the liver king, people taking exogenous testosterone or supplementation and things like that. People think, oh, if I just took that, I'd get huge right? They, now those things certainly help, but when it comes to the bodybuilding space, there are a lot of people, many of whom we work with. I don't think people understand the magnitude of like, these people are genetically gifted. They're, they already are very strong, have a ton of muscle, Kai Green, Phil Heath, without any substances, these people would already be 100%. enormous human beings. Including the liver king. Including the liver king. Yeah. And you, he's doing it now where yeah. he's kind of like detoxing, coming off of it. But like that just amplifies it, right? I think there's this misconception of people thinking, oh, if I just took testosterone or HGH like these guys would, I would be just as big. Yeah. The reality is you wouldn't. <clears throat> um, Absolutely so not. Tell us a little bit about that. So uh, as you, it, it, Ryan and I, we were... Um, we have we have had an opportunity to work with the best physique athletes in the world, the best bodybuilders in the world, uh, period. Um, and no, no, trying to, in all humbleness, in all humbleness, like we probably know more about gaining muscle than probably any, as practically as, as high as there is from a scientific standpoint. So we've worked with the best bodybuilders in the world. And we were in the movies Generation Iron 1 and 2, and if you guys have a chance, if you go and look at Generation Iron uh, 1, um, you'll see that we worked with like guy Ben Pokolsky and his prep for the Mr. Olympia contest. And then in, in Generation Iron 2, we had um, three people with um, Olympia titles. Um, in, in Mr. Olympia, Miss Olympia, there's different Olympia titles. It means you have the greatest physique in your category in the world. So anyway, what I will say is this. When we work with Ben Pokolsky, um, the guy's work ethic was unfreaking believable. I mean, you're talking about a guy that, I and mean, he might train six hours a day. You know what I mean? And he, when he's not doing that, he's recovering or eating. And um, it is a lifestyle that is brutal. It is a lifestyle that is uh, can be lonely, and it, it is it is unbelievable. Like I said, you when we talk about training volume. The thing is, if I bench press, say someone bench presses 200 pounds, if I did, let's do that five times, that'd be a thousand pounds. So these guys, their total training volume might be a, a couple hundred thousand pounds a week. Imagine that. Imagine that. So um, they have to, they have to lift extremely heavy. Then they got to do cardio. You know, 
you might have to do two hours of cardio a day. They might need to lift, um, you know, like take Arnold Schwarzenegger, for example. You know, he was he would train sometimes and it, it's six hour stretches at a time, you know, and then he when he ended up having to do work, he would train two to three hours in the morning, two to three hours at night. Plus, he would end up doing his cardio. And that that's very common among bodybuilders. So you need to understand that like 99.9% of the population, if they took steroids, they d get side effects, the side effects of them, sure, but they, would, um, they wouldn't they would be that impressive. You, you might not know that they even lifted weights. And so um, regard, what, it, what it's allowing them to do is recover faster than saying keep training harder, but 99% of it you know, 90% of it's still the training, the diet, the sleep, the dedication, the sacrifice, and the genetics. Yep. These people are, are definitely the top, we talked about gifted people. They're the top 1% of the 1%. Of the 1%, to, to be on that stage at the Olympia, it's not a, a life of dedication, it's, a, it's the peak genetics. And jumping into longevity and anti-aging, one of the things that we see that probably it isn't conducive to longevity and anti-aging, which is why you say it's brutal. We're seeing some, a lot of these bodybuilders die a very, very young age. Um, they're dropping like flies. They're dropping like flies. A lot of it's like probably too much on their heart. Their heart can't handle yes. that much, right? Yes. You're, you're, some of these bodies weren't meant to hold that much muscle, right? And that's why they do the surveys and they ask Olympic athletes, they've done the surveys, you remember they, they ask Olympic athletes, Hey, if you could take something and you allow you to win a gold medal, but you would die within the next five years, would you take it? I think at least 50% of people raise their hand, maybe more. So I think, you know, it's the warrior. It's, 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 the, it's the warrior. I'm a warrior and I'm willing to do what it takes to, to win. And it's, it's a different mentality. You have to understand the mentality, right? It's different. But yeah, for longevity, uh, Supra physiological levels of testosterone may not be ideal. Uh, do I think there's a place for hormone replacement therapy? Yeah, I do. I, I think like people, why why does someone have to? Why do they have their testosterone levels go down to a hundred when they're in their sixties? Why not bring it to optimal levels? That's different though. Hundred percent. Right. So talk to me about health span. What is health span, and why does it matter? Okay. So the biggest thing to understand: you have lifespan, you have health span. Let's say the average um, lifespan for women, let's say is, I don't know, 80 to 83. Average lifespan for a guy might be 76, 78, depending on wherever, in well-developed countries. Um, now, what, you ha what we think about, there's lifespan and there's health span. Health span is how much of your lifespan you're free of disease. That's a sort of a simplistic definition and it depends on the standards that you're at, okay? But I think that's a, one of the best things. So what do I mean by disease? It could be, um, uh, you know, uh, high blood pressure. It could be diabetes, type 2 diabetes. Um, it could be it could be chronic inflammation. Inflammation could be considered a disease. If you if you have a hard time standing up, that's a, that. For sure. I would call that disease uh, impaired cognitive function, um, you know, dementia. Um, uh, all of these things where we would say, Diseases, things that impact your ability, your act day, activities of daily living. I would say a, a, maybe a better definition is your health span is your life all the way till you're, you've impacted your ability to live normal daily life. That's what I would do. If you do that, it's less. If we say absent disease, okay, I don't have type 2 diabetes. Uh, I don't have super high blood pressure. Okay. That means that maybe 75% of your life, you might live with health span. You know what I mean? So that means that, you know, like if you're 80, maybe you've depleted your health span when you're like 60 something, right? That means that if you're going to live to 80, at 60, you're living with disease from 60 to 80. You're taking pills to lower your blood blood sugar. Mm -hmm. you're, you're taking blood pressure medications or you're taking cholesterol meds because every doctor prescribes them. We don't want to get into that because the worst thing you can do. But the point is, from 60, you're taking a bunch of pills that your doctor's prescribing to you. 
you lost your health span. If you go on our definition, which I think is better, the minute activities of daily living is impaired, what do I mean by that? All of a sudden, someone's in their 40s and they walk up, they start to walk up their stairs and they kind of have to stop to catch their breath. You're telling me your health, you have your health span? No, it's been depleted. Now you've impacted your ability to do what you used to do. That now, I can, if we use that definition, 50% of your life is, is what, what impaired health span. Okay. So, so I would say that's impaired health span and then depleted health span is when you actually have the onset of disease. Um, so that's, that's health span. And so longevity to me is longevity to me, the ultimate life is this. My health spans all the way. If I were to live to a hundred years of age, um, my health span is not depleted until um, somewhere in my 99s. That's that is the ultimate life from a health perspective. Love it. Now, talk to me about Aspie Health. What is it? Why did we create it? So, going back to this, what <laughs> you and I told you, we talked about this. Our goal is to change whole countries in the world. And that is that is why we created FB Health. Um, and basically what that is, is we have, um, we understand, we, we basically our mission is to, to create, to decrease like at least a million biological years by 2030. But we're going to set that those goals even higher. But it, what it stands, what it stems from, is we've created a system with Aspie Health, which I, identifies first an individual's health span. So we actually quantify it on a scale of zero to hundred. We quantify your health span, and from that we derive your biological age. And intriguingly enough, we actually have formulas where we can tell the age of each individual system that makes up that health span. So, so one of the problems that we saw out there is, and I think it's great. I think biological age is an amazing thing, but I go get a blood test. I look at my DNA methylation, you know, and I look at um, uh, my, and I think that's great because it tells you, hey, I'm either younger or older in general, but it doesn't tell you what's happening to your systems. So we've created a, a system with Aspie Health that will identify your health span. It's not just tell you your bio age, tell you your health span, and it'll tell you the health of each of your systems and the, and, and we can from that derive your biological age. But, but what we then can do is then it will, we can automatically create a guidance plan to anti-age you. And it's not based like, Oh, Hey, um, you know, Hey, let's say it's Mike. Hey, Mike, you know, your, um, your chronological age is 50, but your, um, biological age is 60. Here's a, here's, Take this. Eat fruits and vegetables, fruits and, vegetables. and take this curcumin something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Generic. That's not what this is. What we can do is you'll be able to look. We, we already developed a system. You'll look and go, that's the system I'm most weakened. So if you're, in other words, you're 60 mainly because your cardiovascular system. It's these two factors, your muscular system, your cardiovascular system, everything else is healthy. In fact, there, if you looked, if you just weighed at those, it would tell you that you're 42. The reason why it's saying you're 60 is because you have such poor cardiovascular health and poor muscular health. Well, guess what, Mike? Now here's the here's how we reverse those. So it's it's a specific plan. Listen, you need to have a, a specific plan if you're going to anti-age, and that's the thing. That that's so Aspie Health is a way to identify. It's the first thing you need to do: game plan, and then reverse your age. And 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 get your health span all the way up to optimal. It's based on a concept of prime. Think about it to yourself. Like everyone always says like, um, you know, like, man, when I was in my prime, why can't you be in your prime now? And prime changes across lifespan, by the way. You know, your, your prime when you're in your 40s or 50s might be different than when you were 15. You, your lifetime, your, your environment changes. Why can't you be in your prime now? Aspie Health was designed to bring you there in a systematic, scientific fashion based on millions of data points. So what Ryan and I, what we have done um, while we've been collecting all this data, we've been collecting thousands and hundreds of thousands and millions of data points to create a system that we can really truly want to help the world. 
Incredible. I'm super excited about that. I know it's going to help change entire nations, right? Um, and I think there's a lot of people out there, people are starting to really talk about aging, longevity, um, how do we kind of prevent it? What's the holy grail behind it? Um, and right now, the telomere test and that DNA testing is kind of what most people look to as a standard. But I think what really separates us, to your point, is like we can identify these different systems and then provide practical recommendations because we all know like I can take a swab test, I can rub my cheek or spit mm -hmm. in a tube or even take blood and I can look at it and it can tell me my, my biological age. That won't tell me if I'm more likely to fall up, the, fall down the stairs, break my hip, and we know within six months you're done. You know that that test might look good on on paper. And it might give you a false sense of comfort. Hundred percent, and that's what we're trying to avoid, yeah. right? We want to truly help people see where they're all, where they're at, um, and then provide them guidance on how to improve that and become in their prime. Hundred percent. Is that that's the goal of Aspi Health? So let's talk about tips. What are some quick tips for improving someone's health span? Um, so I think the the biggest things that I would say is quick, quick, quick tips. Number one, change your pattern of eating, mm -hmm. meaning that the majority of people in our society, the average uh, thing is they will um, fast only nine hours a day is like your average. And that results in a lot of problems. Um, we'll get into that. And, um, um, in, in a whole topic, but I would say you probably need a, a minimum fast 12 hours a day and ultimately probably at least 14 to 20 hours a day. And that's number one. Number two, make sure that you're getting high quality protein, which we talked about. And I told you about mitochondria with Gabe. So you need to make sure with every meal you're getting high quality protein. Um, uh, so that's number two. Number three is steps, which is just your base movement. Active need, active does it really happen until you're past like 7,500 steps? So 7,500 to 10,000 plus steps is that range you want to be in every single day. Um, you know, make sure that you're, you're moderately active at 7,500. Make sure you're hitting that every single day. Be great if you got 10,000. Um, the next thing is your, is uh, cardio. Probably at least one to two sessions like Ryan did is I, uh, optimal. Listen, for health and longevity, I don't care if you did what I did this morning, got 45 seconds all out. If you did that twice a week, you'd have great cardiovascular health. And you combine that with your steps, you'd have a strong cardiovascular system. So at least probably two cardiovascular challenges a week. Um, and again, I don't care if you have a minute, make the minute count. If you have 15 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes, great. You're going to optimize your body composition too. And then lifting weights. Listen, Ryan talked about this. One of the number one things that happens when we age, I don't care how good and strong your heart is. People fall. When you break your hip, you got six months and you're going to die. That's what the statistics show. So everyone should be lifting weights. I don't care if you're 80 or 90. I don't care if you're in your 40s or 30s. You should be lifting weights. Every body part, at least, every, at least once a week, guys. It, you have time to do one... I don't care if it's one hard set, make a compound movement and do one hard set. Um, I'm asking you to do, I would prefer you do it once every five days, but at least every seven days, one hard set, one compound movement. That means you could do squats or lunges. It could be body weight. Don't care. Um, it could be your back, your chest, your biceps, everything. One exercise for every body part, at least every five days in a perfect world, you do two to three sets every five days. Um, I think, um, and then of course, make sure that, um, you know, you're getting uh, fruits and, and excuse me, vegetables. I think are good berries. I like, yeah. um, but I think, uh, avocados are fun. avocados. Okay. There you, go. there you go. There you go. There you go. Berries, avocado. Uh, and then I would definitely have greens in your diet. I think that's good. People will debate me and that's fine, but I think it certainly keeps you full. 100%. It keeps you full and it keeps you satiated. So I think that, and, and it's definitely all the tips I'm telling you all have studies with anti-aging. So I'm telling you tips like higher fiber intakes reduces mortality rate. Like your probability of death is lower if you have higher fiber intake. Everything I'm telling you, we're basing, what is, what is first to find aging? What is aging? Um, it's an increased probability of death, disease, and suffering. 
Every tip we told you decreases your probability of death, disease, and suffering. Therefore, it's anti-aging. So I think those are the quick tips. I think we're going to have to come back and do an entire episode. Yes. Uh, so if you guys want to hear an entire episode, let us know in the comments because we need to just, there's a, everyone's interested in anti-aging, longevity. How do I live not only longer, but a higher quality of life? 100%. And I think we just, we could probably spend hours talking. A hundred percent. So, and we'll have more on Aspie Health by that time. We'll, yeah, we'll, yeah, uh, yeah. we'll so tease some things really when, when we come back. Right. I want to wrap this up. This has been an incredible episode. Uh, thank you so much. I, I want to do what we're going to call our final four, like in basketball, uh, quick hitters, um, things that are kind of just random things about you, about what you're focused on, where you're at. First one is, what is your favorite snack and favorite meal? Like what's something you love to snack on? And then what's like, I know Isabella makes some incredible meals, or if you guys are going out, what's your favorite meal? My, well, my favorite meal going out is, is definitely steak. Um, and, uh, a, okay, my favorite meal going out is um, start off with like um, a chilled shrimp. Um, and then after that, I would go to like a, a Caesar salad, but not Caesar ranch instead of croutons bacon. And then uh, a ribeye steak that's Chicago style. I mean, it's charred on the outside, maybe, maybe medium on the inside. The, um, and mushrooms. That's my, that's my favorite going out meal. My favorite at home meal is burger with bacon, no bun. Maybe dipping in and ranch and the low carb, no sugar ketchup. That's my. I mean, I li I like that at home. Um, snack. Snack. Oh, um, I don't snack that much. You know that, right? <laughs> I know. So uh, Quest bars are good. I like those. You'll have a little bit of popcorn sometimes. I love popcorn. Okay. Um, I love popcorn. There's a brand called like Pip Corn or something like that. But I like. I think. Mm -hmm. But I, they have. But anyway, I like popcorn. I like. Um, there's a popcorn I have, and it's. Um, uh, truffle, mm. truffle popcorn sounds good, and uh, um, sea salt and vinegar popcorn, because and again that's going because of carbs. But they're it's lo fairly low carb, right? So I do snack on that. Got it. Second thing, favorite book of all time, and what are you currently reading? I mean, you know, my favorite book of all time is the Bible. Mm -hmm. I've, I am currently reading it. I've read it like a probably three hundred times. What am I currently reading? Um, well. Actually, well, I just finished, um, uh, a, a, I'm, I'm reading, I'm taking a course on behavioral economics right now. And it's basically, it's a, it's a course on behavioral economics, um, and obviously a book with it. Um, but I, I think it's, I think it's great in terms of just understanding probabilities of human behavior and stuff like that. So I'm into a lot of books on like behaviorism and psychology. Um, my favorite book that I, uh, I'm getting ready to read mass read this week is the psychology of sales by Brian Tracy. Oh, great. So that I'll read now because next week I'm going to be going to an event where that'd be very important. Love it. What are you most excited about in your life right now? Um, what am I most excited about in my life right now? Um, well, you know, I would say that, that um, I'm very excited about what we're doing with, uh, obviously, obviously very excited about my family and Isabella and, um, and, uh, the newborn kid I'm going to have. So I'm, I have, I'm going to have to say that right first. Absolutely. Um, but I will say, um, in terms of what we're doing, ask me help. We have an opportunity, like everyone watching this, I know for a fact that people who watch this and, um, end out, um, uh, utilizing the ASPE health system on average, you're going to anti-age like 10, 15 years immediately like within the first year and i'm excited about that i'm excited people having the vitality and the health that my parents have um that's what i'm most excited about that and i'm excited about doing that on a global scale um we will we're going to be working with royalty um um on getting that across the whole world um for sure incredible I'm most excited about that Last question, what's one thing people can do today to improve their health? What's one thing that you could recommend them to do? You talked about a bunch. What do you want? <clears throat> well, besides the things that I talked it about? It could be one of, like if you, if people had to pick one um, and you're like, do this today, this will help improve your health. Um, okay. Well, it's going to be a toss up between the intermittent fasting and um, the 
cardio, I would say. This is a muscle guy. I said muscle guy. <laughs> but I'm talking about like for longevity, I would say if they could do one thing, one thing, it would just be one time per week doing what Ryan does, Dr. Ryan does on the Peloton in terms of intensity. If you set aside 15 minutes a week to do that, man, your health span is going to increase drastically. If you can push your body to that extreme for 15 minutes once a week, you're not going to be have, probably not going to have type two diabetes, right? It's so many things you're involved. And of course, you know, the second thing is probably intermittent fasting. Love Actually, it. or man, it's tough, man. Carb restrict. Yeah. Carb restrict. You know what? I'm going to take it back. Let me rewind. Carb restrict. <laughs> That's going to be my number <laughs> one. My number, because I'm training. What? It's tough. You can pick one thing. Mm-hmm. Restrict carbohydrates. Love it. If you restrict carbohydrates, you, you're pro- it's probably the number one thing that you can do in, in life for a longer health span, low inflammation, um, better cognitive function, because it's something that you do every day. Restrict carbs. Brother, this has been an incredible, incredible podcast. We'll definitely do probably several more of these. Little man will probably watch this when <laughs> when uh, he's, he's old enough to watch it and be super impressed. Before we go, where can people find you? Um, what's like social media, website, at the muscle PhD? Yeah, so, uh, well, hey, I'm on YouTube. We talk a lot about this stuff on Instagram. Um, and uh, obviously the website is... So all the social uh, YouTube is uh, muscle P, the muscle PhD Instagram the muscle PhD Dr Jacob Wilson you could look up um, and of course the muscle PhD.com on there we have a lot of great stuff tons of articles tons of videos about prim- primarily on there it's centered more around losing fat um, or improving your muscle um, and we even have a whole academy on it as well. Love Highly it. recommend it. Yeah. Thank you so much. We will talk. Thanks soon. for having me on, uh, Ryan. I really appreciate it, man. Thanks, brother. Thank you. Thank you.